to work with local authorities and the Scottish Futures Trust to make sure that we can deliver for families in the way that we have set out. Thank you. I'm afraid that ends questions this afternoon. And we have to now move on to the next item of business, which is a debate on motion number 15430 in the name of Liam MacArthur on education. I'd be grateful if all of those members who wish to speak in this debate could press the request to speak buttons now. I have to notify the Chamber at the outset that we are very tight for time. There is no extra time at all in this debate, so brevity would be appreciated. And I call on Liam MacArthur to speak to and move the motion. Maximum 10 minutes, please, Mr MacArthur. Deputy President, I am aware that even since the start of the year we have had numerous debates on education, but I do not make any apology for returning to that subject uh, here this afternoon. Education, after all, is the key to unlocking the potential of each of us as individuals, and it lies at the heart of what we aspire to be as a society and determines our success as an economy. It is an area where Scotland has traditionally excelled, and still today there are many aspects of our education system that are genuinely world-class. Equally, however, the warning signs are there that in some areas trends are going in the wrong direction and for far too many of those from more disadvantaged backgrounds, the education system is failing them. The recent OECD report captured this picture very well. It offered signs of encouragement but also confirmed that we are seeing falling standards in literacy and numeracy while the gap in attainment between rich and the rest remains wide and largely untouched. The OECD concluded that we are at quote, a watershed moment for education in this country. A leading educationalist told the Education Committee this week that if we are not careful, we could snatch defeat from the jaws of victory. Scottish Liberal Democrats agree, which is why we are prioritising education and the proper funding of education over the next five years. <laughs> Ministers will argue that this is what they are doing already. However, too often their actions lack ambition or a willingness to put their money where their mouth is. Expansion of early learning and childcare and the establishment of the Attainment Fund are good examples, both very worthy in themselves, but under-resourced, under-delivered, and in the case of the Attainment Fund, poorly targeted. Meanwhile, savage cuts to council budgets of £500 million, the very councils that are uh, required to deliver school education, and an obsession with national testing in primary schools seems inconsistent with a determin or seems consistent sorry, with a determination to, dis to snatch defeat from the jaws of victory. Of course, SNP ministers never tire of lecturing other parties on the uh, yes, okay. Stuart Maxwell. Could I have Stuart Maxwell's microphone? Thank Just you. Just for absolute clarity, to those members who were not involved in the in informal discussion in the Education Committee with the individual you are referring to, mm. can you also confirm that he said that Scottish education was well above average and, in fact, was, was seen worldwide as still a beacon of good educational standards? Liam MacArthur. I think that's exactly what I said in the opening remarks. I mean, SNP ministers will lecture other parties uh, on offering up alternatives and be clear uh, on what uh, they do about paying for them. This is despite the fact uh, that they're able to magic up uh, money for projects wherever the mood or the news cycle dictates and despite running an underspend of hundreds of millions of pounds. But the challenge is not an unfair one, so let me respond. Unlike the SNP, Scottish Liberal Democrats are determined to use the full powers of this Parliament to make a difference in education. And with those powers, we can make a real difference on education. My colleague Willie Rennie set out earlier today plans to transform Scottish education over the next five years. By committing to raising income tax by one pence, we will be able to spend £475 million more on education next year alone. The biggest investment in education since devolution. And what a difference that could make. It could help redress some of the damage done to our college sector over recent years by a government hell bent on slashing budgets, jobs and places. 150,000 fewer places representing 150,000 opportunities lost for those looking for the skills they need. These extra resources could help reverse some of the savage cuts made by John Swinney to the council budgets. Cuts, let's face it, that will dig deepest into education and children's services at a local level. There would also be an opportunity, not at this moment, an uh, opportunity to deliver on the, prim on the promises made by ministers in relation to early learning and childcare. At present, rather than the promised 27 per cent of two-year-olds from more disadvantaged backgrounds accessing provision, a mere 7 per cent are reaping the benefits. South of the border, the figure is 42 per cent. That shortfall is unacceptable and does nothing to help address the attainment gap. 
Save the Children and others make clear that the foundations for the attainment gap are established in the earliest years, often before a child is even born. Evidence shows that for every pound spent before a child is three, £11 is, sent, is saved later in life. As well as helping close the attainment gap, this represents investment in our economy and the social well-being of our country. That is why Scottish Liberal Democrats have placed such high priority on targeting what resources are available on the early years and those who need it most. It is an approach reflected in our consistent argument for extending free early learning and childcare to two-year-olds from the poorest backgrounds. It is also, Deputy Presiding Officer, Officer, why we have challenged the approach taken by this Government in relation to its attainment fund. Again, as I have done on many uh, occasions previously, I welcome the additional resources. However, the way Ministers have decided to spend the money is wrong. Firstly, it was targeted at a mere half dozen councils. Since then, more local authorities and schools have been added to the list, to the point where the Minister now boasts that 64 per cent of disadvantaged pupils uh, now benefit from funding. Yet 11 councils, including Orkney, Shetland and Aberdeenshire, remain excluded. Children from poorer backgrounds in these areas, whose needs may be every bit as great as their counterparts elsewhere in the country, are deemed by this Government as ineligible for that support. And they're not alone. Almost 30,000 children, it appears, are set to lose out on a postcode lottery entirely of ministers making. I thought Ian Gray in the debate earlier this month summed up the absurdity very well when he talked about Cochrane Castle and St David's schools in Johnson's who share one building but where one gets attainment funding while the other does not. And it's not just the inconsistency between neighbouring schools but also between neighbouring streets in some cases. Uh, how on earth is it going to be squared with the First Minister's promise to close the uh, attainment gap completely? Assuming the First Minister and Cabinet Secretary are serious in their intentions, they must recognise that funding should be based on the individual needs of the individual child wherever they live. That is the underlying principle behind the pupil premium. It is working south of the border, thanks to Liberal Democrats. We want to see the same principle applied here in Scotland. This year... Very briefly. Thank you for taking the intervention. I'm always somewhat apprehensive about a Liberal Democrat talking about uh, finances and education, giving you a history on tuition, fee, tuition fees. Could you, uh, Ms. MacArthur, tell us how much would the pupil premium be for every pupil? What's the total cost? And how much is the one pence income tax going to... Liam MacArthur. Well, I've already explained that it would deliver an extra £475 million uh, a year into education, something I'm sure, as a former spokesman on finance for the Liberal Democrats, Chip Brodie would uh, uh, acknowledge. This year, funding available equated to £1,320 per primary, £935 per secondary pupil south of the border. The average size school, with average numbers in receipt of free school meals, this would represent £200,000. Many schools use the funding for individual coaching, but other projects have included summer classes for pupils moving from primary to secondary school, as well as paying for transport for extracurricular activities. According to Ofsted in 2014, the pupil premium is making a difference in many schools. Similarly, the National Audit Office noted last year that early signs are that the pupil premium has potential effusive praise uh, by auditor standards. Are there areas that need improvement? Yes. Will it take time for this approach to demonstrate its full value? Probably. But is it already delivering results in closing the gap in attainment at primary and secondary levels in England? And does it merit being rolled out here in Scotland? Absolutely. The Minister's spin doctor was busy earlier this week dismissing the idea as unfunded, not true, and unproven, similarly, not true. Presumably, this spin doctor is less open to embracing new ideas than the First Minister and Ms Constant declare themselves to be. The Labour Party, I think, seems supportive of the idea of a pupil premium, although the, the thoris, I think, the thoris has been used uh, to find other ways of expressing it. But I genuinely welcome the support that they've shown for the principle of targeting funding on the needs of the individual child, something that the Labour peer, Lord Adonis, a fan of the pupil premium, argued for very strongly. Meanwhile, the Tory amendment claims that it was all Dave's idea. Uh, I would question that, and certainly the political drive behind the pupil premium came from Liberal Democrat ministers in the previous UK government. Nevertheless, again, I welcome the support of Liv Smith, uh, though I think it would be clarity uh, needed on how the Tories plan to pay for this north of the border, but I'm sure Ms Smith will come to that in her speech. So it seems the SNP are now the only ones advocating an, an area-based approach rather than ones based on the needs of the individual child. That is a shame, but it won't stop Scottish Liberal Democrats continuing to argue for a more effective and well-funded approach. 
The gaps in attainment uh, and achievement continue to scar the lives by preventing the potential of each and every individual uh, being realised. They are a drag on our economy and invariably a cost in our society. That is why, just one of the reasons why Scottish Liberal Democrats have taken the decision today not just to prioritise education, but to prioritise the means of delivering the ends. This would be the biggest investment in education since devolution. It could deliver transformational change. I hope the next Parliament will have the courage to use the powers at its disposal to make that happen. And I have pleasure in moving the motion in my name. Many thanks. I now call on Dr Alistair Allen to speak to and move Amendment 15430.3 in the name of Angela Constance. Minister, maximum seven minutes, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Two weeks ago in this Parliament, the Cabinet Secretary set out this Government's determination to focus on the twin aims of excellence and equity within our education system. To deliver a world-class system which has at its heart the tenet that all of Scotland's children must be able to achieve their educational potential, breaking the link between poorer attainment and poverty in the process. We have a duty to take bold action to ensure achievement of those twin aims. Now, the recent OECD report confirmed that with uh, Curriculum for Excellence we are on the right track and that our system has many strengths, including our holistic approach, the four capacities, professional engagement, a high degree of consensus and enthusiasm for learning and teaching. Now, I see that in action week in and week out when I visit schools. We already know that our system is a good one and is delivering high, higher standards of achievement for most children. Last year, there was a record number of passes at higher and advanced higher, and more young people received qualifications relating to wider skills for life and work. More students are staying on at school until sixth year, fewer are leaving with very low or no qualifications, and all young people can now undertake relevant work-related learning as part of their curriculum. And now more than nine out of ten of last year's school leavers were in employment, education or training nine months later. So we are in a good place, but we cannot, I accept, be complacent. We know that some children from our most deprived communities do not do as well as they should. In an excellent and equitable education system, we cannot allow that to continue. And that is why we already have a relentless focus on improving the outcomes of these children, supported by an additional four-year, £100 million Attainment Scotland Fund. In 2015... I will, yes. Liam McArthur. I'm very grateful to the Minister. I, I, I mean, he set out the, the funding that's available and he's explained the relentless focus on those from more disadvantaged backgrounds. But he'll be aware that many of those in, from more disadvantaged backgrounds, 36 per cent roughly, do not fall within the ambit of the attainment fund. And therefore, how are their needs being reflected with equal priority to others elsewhere in Scotland? Minister. Well, the, the fact that, uh, in addition to the, the local authority-based approach, the fact that there is the 57 schools which have been identified, and beyond that, many sources of intervention uh, in the lives of uh, individual families and individual communities, is a recognition that there are many solutions to this problem. But I have to say that I would very strongly defend uh, the intervention, the major intervention, uh, that, uh, the, uh, uh, that the challenge represents. Now, I would say also that uh, the focus around this has been uh, on primary schools, as we know how important early preventative work is in improving children's longer-term outcomes. Over 300 schools in our most deprived communities have benefited from this funding, and that is, uh, I should say to the member, some uh, 54,000 children. Local authorities and schools have worked hard to put in place the approaches which will really make a difference, approaches which are based on evidence of what works. They have thought long and hard about the children in their school and how this funding can support them, and the result is targeted and focused work on literacy, numeracy and health and well-being, both within and beyond the school. Family link workers, speech and language therapists, community learning workers alongside teachers are paid for by uh, the Attainment Scotland Fund, alongside work to develop programmes and approaches to close the equity gap. The pupil premium approach in place in England and Wales, uh, and which uh, seems to be recommended by some in this place, is uh, yet to be shown to have had an impact. The June 2015 National Audit Report concluded that it was too early for the impact to be known. 
and it also concluded that uh, per pupil funding had fallen in real terms in 45% of schools between 2011-12 and 2014-15, with funding for the 16% most disadvantaged secondary schools having fallen by more than 5% over the same period, despite the introduction of the pupil premium. In Scotland, our average per pupil spending in 2014-15 for both primary and secondary was higher than in England, and the Attainment Scotland Fund will provide additional funding to those children and communities who face some of the greatest challenges, and we will continue to do that. It is clear that where there are large concentrations of children living in deprived communities, there is a greater need for support, and our approach delivers that. We will continue to review how we target funding to ensure that we reach the children and the young people whose outcomes are impacted greatly by living in poverty. Whilst our focus is on schools where there are high concentration of children living in deprived communities, we are also aware of the need for universal support to close the attainment gap and have enhanced the support already available by putting an attainment advisor in place for every authority. The development of the National Improvement Framework, uh, the Primary 1 to 3 Read, Write, Count campaign and our Making Maths Count programme. We mustn't lose sight of the fact that success is elusive for a small number of our children uh, and a significant number of our children uh, from deprived communities. The gap in attainment is narrowing, but if we are to achieve our ambition of delivering a world-class education system for all of our children, then we must and we will do more. Our approach to targeted funding through the Attainment Scotland Fund is clear evidence, I believe, of our attainment uh, of our determination uh, rather to achieve just that uh, and I move uh, the amendment in Ms Constance's name. Many thanks. I now call on Ian Gray to speak to and move amendment 15430.2 maximum five minutes please Mr Gray. Thank you very much presiding officer. I rise to move the amendment in my name not in any great uh, opposition in truth to the motion from the Liberal Democrats because our proposals do uh, as Mr MacArthur uh, alluded to, bear uh, significant uh, similarities. Although, uh, in developing our own proposal, we did consult rather more than a thesaurus to find a different name for it. Uh, and indeed, one of the things that we did consult was the work in research and analysis that had been done uh, of the pupil premium. And so, uh, I would argue that the proposal we put forward today, and have done already on a number of occasions, is uh, a more focused and more detailed proposal uh, and indeed, it is closer, in fact, to what was introduced in Wales, uh, where some changes were made to the pupil premium exactly to try and meet uh, some of the flaws which had been identified. Perhaps the most significant flaw identified with the pupil premium is that, although Ofsted did, as Mr MacArthur say, find some evidence of effectiveness, uh, it also found some evidence of head teachers banking the, attain the, the pupil premium uh, as part of their overall budget and in fact not using it in any way to, to help close the attainment gap. And, uh, our proposal, as I will come to later, does uh, try to avoid that as a possibility. But where we do very much agree uh, uh, with uh, Mr MacArthur is on the weaknesses of the approach uh, of the SNP government. We have argued previously and continue to argue that the attainment fund, while welcome, uh, is a, inadequate uh, in, in that it is not enough funds uh, and it is wrongly targeted. And I think uh, really the Minister rather gave that away when he said they would continue to consider how it is targeted, which gives the game away, I think, that uh, since this fund has been announced, the government has shown every sign of making it up as they go along. Uh, in their targeting. And I have in the past given examples of some of the, the worst cases of uh, uh, the result of that approach. And Mr MacArthur referred to one, the two schools in Johnson, Cochrane Castle and St David's. Uh, two schools, one campus, one entrance, one gym hall, one, uh, uh, one dinner, uh, dinner hall. Um, pupils coming from exactly the same streets. Uh, and yet one of those schools gets attainment funding and the other one doesn't. And in fact, the one that gets no attainment challenge funding is the one that has more pupils uh, from uh, poorer parts uh, of that community. But we see the same thing elsewhere. In, in East Ayrshire and Kilmarnock, 
Uh, I have seen uh, an example of a street which is divided by a catchment area boundary so that children from the same street go to two different schools and in one of those schools they will benefit from attainment challenge funding and in the other uh, they will not. I was in the borders uh, earlier this week where only two primary schools in the whole of the Scottish borders get attainment challenge funding. Both of them are in Hoyk, so in Galashiels where I was, uh, no schools benefit at all. And I have not surprisingly spoken before about the example of my own constituency where not one single school benefits uh, from attainment challenge funding. So that is why uh, we have proposed an alternative, Fair Start funding, £1,000, which follows uh, every child with a free school meal entitlement to uh, primary school. That would uh, benefit pretty well every primary school uh, in the country, uh, but it would mean that the head teacher would have to use those resources uh, from a, 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 a choice, a suite of agreed evidence-based interventions which we know would really make a difference, as is the case in Wales. Um, our, our fund, sorry, I'm really pushed for time. Um, our fund would also provide uh, a, a lesser fund to nurseries, providing a uh, free nursery place entitlement, because Mr MacArthur is right when he says all the evidence is intervention must be as early as possible. And what would the benefit of all this be? Well, for the borders, which I referred to earlier, their primary schools would share some £860,000. In East Ayrshire, £1.9 million uh, in a council area where at the moment only six primary schools benefit. And in my own constituency of East Lothian, almost £1 million. That means in my constituency, some schools would have a fund every single year of around £85,000, which they could use to employ additional staff, classroom assistants, particular equipment, or to run particular programmes in literacy and numeracy, whatever the staff and head teachers in those schools thought would be possible. Indeed, Daughter, close, please. indeed uh, uh, schools in the borders in East Ayrshire would benefit to the tune of over £100,000 a year. Presiding officer, this would be a transformational change in the future of these children and a transformational change in the future of our country. And that is why uh, we think it is worth support, uh, not just from opposition parties, but from the government too. Thank you. I'm afraid I must reiterate that we are very short of time. I now call on Liz Smith to speak to and move Amendment 15430.1. Uh, thank minutes. you, Deputy Presiding Officer. And we are uh, delighted that the Liberals have chosen this topic uh, for debate because I think it is incumbent upon all, us all of us ahead of the election uh, to set out our manifesto stalls uh, when it comes to addressing the attainment gap. And I think all parties in this chamber are agreed uh, very much on the fact that there has to be additional funding, but there are clearly very sharp distance differences about how that can be allocated. Now, the pupil premium uh, is part of that debate. Now, I know the, like, the Liberals like to claim uh, credit for this, uh, but uh, I will have to correct them on that because it is a long-time Conservative pledge. I have the evidence of that right here. It's a policy that we believe uh, brings very specific advantages when it comes to doing two things. Firstly, identifying those most in need, and secondly, creating the incentives to ensure that every effort is made to target the resources on these pupils. And I noticed that the Cabinet Secretary said in response to Willie Rennie just last Friday that the policy is neither costed nor proven to work. And I want to challenge her on that, as I think the facts, or most of the facts anyway, prove otherwise. Now, before I do so, can I just flag up again the academic works of both uh, Sue Ellis and Jim McCormick, respected, I think, by the Scottish Government as much as they are by the rest of us, as these have very clearly shown that the majority of deprived children do not actually live in the most deprived areas. And I think the use of the SIMD index is therefore very limited, since it does tend to target the whole school, or in some cases the whole local authority, uh, by the postcode. So the benefit of the pupil premium is obviously, as Ian Gray and, Willie and uh, uh, Lee MacArthur have both said, that it is actually following the individual child. And there is one proviso to this, which I'll come to in a minute. In England, that 2015-16 uh, pupil premium varies from 935 per annum to 1,900. And they are obviously paid to pupils who've been eligible for a free school meal in one of the six previous years. Now, that money is paid directly to the school on behalf of each individual recipient pupil, which numbers uh, three out of 10. 
uh, in, in both England and Wales, and that can be spent by the school accordingly in a way that best fits the pupils concerned. And I heard what Ian Gray said about not banking up the money. I think there's a way around that. A great deal of attention has recently been focused on helping schools to provide uh, the individual attention on the most disadvantaged pupils. And if you read the reports from the vast majority of the, of the head teachers, I think it's very clear that a high proportion of them have uh, very clear evidence that that pupil premium is working for the most disadvantaged. And of course, that can be measured by the outcomes in these schools, uh, but more than anything else. And I think uh, the Minister perhaps will be interested uh, to read uh, the 2015 Sutton Trust report, uh, because I think it's uh, very helpful to providing some of the evidence that we need to see to ensure uh, that this policy can be taken forward. Obviously, 2.5 billion was the cost uh, for pupil premiums in 2014-16. That's 6% of the total school's budget down south. Uh, but the important thing is that schools are, are held absolutely accountable, if necessary, by the Auditor General for exactly how they are spending it. No edicts from central or from local government and I think the important thing is that there are actually no right answers, uh, but there is full autonomy and accountability. And I think one of the best lessons to be learnt from schools in England is entirely up to uh, the uh, schools not to treat the uh, disadvantaged pupils as a homogenous group. And I think that's a very uh, important lesson. Now, I appreciate that there are other advantages. I won't go into these just now, and they're probably ones that the Liberals uh, would not accept, and that's because they provide greater incentives to those uh, who are at the cutting edge of encouraging academy and free schools. Uh, that's something that uh, is a debate perhaps more for down south, but nonetheless, it's important in principle for up here, uh, particularly at a time where I think we have more parents. Um, parents, incidentally, who are absolutely wedded to the best values of the state <coughs> sector wanting to see some diversity in the state provision uh, of schooling. That's something that the Scottish Conservatives obviously want to do. Now, it's very clear that both the Labour Party and the Liberals have committed uh, to much higher tax rates in order to fund this. The Scottish Conservatives will not do that. We have used our costings on the SPICE uh, figures and with the Scottish Government figures that were produced uh, at the end of last year um, looking at the 100 million that has been promised for the attainment fund, but also relating that to the supplementary financial memorandum for the education bill, which was published uh, last week, in which there are clearly significantly increased costs that the Scottish Government has acknowledged and therefore is presumably in the business uh, of providing. Uh, to our mind, the basic would be £136 million. I'm so happy to put on record uh, how we've calculated that. Draw to close, please. And I think that uh, there will be circumstances um, if, if we can uh, make use of that uh, supplementary financial memorandum where we can drill down further on that. The Scottish Conservatives are quite happy to put before the electorate not just the principle of this, but also the costings uh, of that. So may I conclude, Deputy Presiding Officer, First Minister said our overall aim is to raise standards everywhere, but to raise them most quickly in the areas that most need it. I entirely accept that, but it will not happen if we use SIMD. It has to be on a pupil-by-pupil -pupil basis. So may I move the amendment in my name? Thank you. We now turn to the open debate. Speeches of four minutes, please. Stuart Maxwell to be followed by Alec Crowley. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, Presiding officer, Parliament has dedicated a considerable amount of time um, recently to the issue of educational attainment, and it's quite right that we have done so. The ambition that all of Scotland's children are given the opportunity to fulfil their potential, regardless of background, is one that I'm certain is shared right across this chamber. It is in this spirit that I welcome the chance to speak in this afternoon's debate on education. However, I must say that I was uh, more than a little disappointed to hear Willie Rennie describe Scotland's education sector as being at a crisis point. Whilst there is recognition that there is still work to do, particularly in areas such as attainment, I think it is rather disingenuous, to say the least, to describe Scotland's school as being in some sort of crisis. Now, I realise the Lib Dems may not be in any rush to consult the opinion polls, but I draw Mr Rennie's attention to the recent Servation poll showing the positive net satisfaction ratings of plus 28 per cent from voters in favour of the SNP's record on education. Now, such positive poll ratings are not exactly in indicative of an electorate that considers the education system of Scotland to be universally failing. Indeed, the SNP and Government has taken a number of positive steps in its drive to improve standards in Scotland's schools. On Monday, the First Minister announced a further £230 million for the construction of 19 new schools across Scotland. Since 2007, the Scottish Government has worked with local authorities to rebuild or refurbish over 600 schools across the country. Now, last week, thanks to a PQ lodged by my colleague George Adam, we heard that the number of school leavers going into education and worker training is at a record high. 
contributing to the highest level of youth employment for a decade. The number of children in Scotland benefiting from a free school meal has also more than doubled to over 259,000 in the past year, providing vital support to children from low-income families. Earlier this month, the First Minister unveiled the Innovation Fund as part of the package of support available through the £100 million Scottish Attainment Fund. Now, the Innovation Fund is open to all schools, not just in those local authorities that have been targeted for support through the Attainment Fund, and complements the work of the Attainment Advisors that have been recruited for every council area. Presenting officer, I have listened carefully to the case put forward by the Lib Dems, and I have tried to do so with an open mind, but I have yet to see any compelling evidence that a pupil premium approach to tackling the attainment gap would be more effective than the attainment challenge programme advocated by the Scottish Government. The Lib Dems argue, and we heard it again here today, that the pupil premium has been a rousing success in England. I really don't have the time, I apologise. Um, however, a recent YouGov survey of teachers in England found that less than half of teachers believe that the pupil premium has been effective. Indeed, 4% of teachers said that they thought that the policy had actually had a negative impact on disadvantaged pupils. Furthermore, uh, the report last year by the National Audit Office suggested that any reduction in the attainment gap as a result of the pupil premium has been marginal, marginal at best. To quote directly from the report, while the attainment gap has narrowed since 2011, it remains wide, and at this stage, the significance of the improvements is unclear. That is hardly a rousing endorsement for the pupil premium policy advocated by the Lib Dems. Presenting officer, removing barriers to educational attainment is a challenging but important undertaking. The OECD report in December underlined many of the successes in our education system, highlighting clear upward trends in recent years in areas such as attainment and positive school leaver destinations. However, the OECD review group also highlighted a number of challenges, and there is undoubtedly much more work to do so that our education system delivers for every child in Scotland. I believe that a good quality education is key to ensuring that children from disadvantaged backgrounds have a ladder of opportunity to escape the poverty trap. I therefore welcome the Scottish Government's determination to further strengthen Scotland's education sector and to ensure that our young people leave school with the education and indeed the skills that they need to fulfil their potential. Many thanks. Before I call our next speaker, can I remind the Chamber that the Code of Conduct requires that no member in the Chamber turn their back on the presiding officer. I now call Alec Rowley to be followed by George Adam. Presiding officer, thank you. Um, like Stuart Maxwell, I agree that there are a whole range of factors that will be important in actually school buildings um, and the type of facilities that young people are taught in are important. Um, that is why I welcome the types of partnerships that have been put in place, recognising the investment of the Scottish Government, but also the investment of local authorities. Last week I visited um, a new school build in Glasgow where three primaries are being pulled together into one, so local authorities are doing some innovative work to actually get those new facilities in place. I would ask the Minister to agree to come and visit my constituency in Inverkeaton High School, which is in a dire state and need a replacement. And, uh, I was really disappointed that in the announcement last week, whilst those schools that were welcomed uh, were welcomed, the, the announcement uh, Inverkeaton was not one of them. And, and so school buildings are important. It would be wrong today to not also mention the massive pressure that education authorities are in up and down the country, um, whilst I perhaps would not use, use the term um, crisis for education, what I would do is firstly acknowledge the hard work that is going on in schools um, in every community in Scotland for the teachers and all the staff that are involved in schools, and they are under immense pressure. Uh, you just need to talk to teachers locally to know the pressure that they are working under with the difficulties and the budget cuts that are taking place. And the budget cuts that are taking place will perhaps not affecting teacher numbers. If we are seeing classroom assistance being cut, if we are seeing, for example, continued professional development um, being cut, then that will have a massive impact on. Because if you look at Fife, that is an example where they focused millions of pounds into raising attainment, and a big part of that came around leadership. So there was a major investment programme around leadership in the schools, but there was also a major investment programme uh, to ensure that, that teachers had the support to be able to do more to lift attainment and lift numeracy and literacy levels. So, in a sense, if, if, if education authorities are cutting these areas, 
then that will have a negative impact uh, on, on the attainment levels. The other criticism that I've heard in terms of the government scheme, although well-intentioned, is that it tends to just be uh, input-based with little regard to, to outputs and tends to be project after project after project, and we find more and more staff spend their time trying to write bids and write projects, um, and that we need to really try and move away from that. And that's why I think the proposal coming forward for Labour through the Fair Start Fund actually allows us to target money at schools and actually do something about that. And that's a point, I mean, Alistair Allen talked about the OCD report, and there is a lot of positives in the OCD report um, in terms of curriculum for excellence and the direction that we're going in, and I'd be the first to recognise that. There was a few points, however, that I wanted to mention. For example, they talk on page 80 um, that not all the findings can be described as positive. Education Scotland inspection reports, for example, for example gave as many as one in five schools only a satisfactory evaluation and inspections. Now, that is, that is quite staggering. Um, not good, not very good, not excellent, but satisfactory. And that can't be satisfactory for this Parliament. And so it shows that there are areas where a lot of work has to be done. There is other parts of that report that there's not time for me to draw attention to today, but they do talk about the number of uh, different projects that are being done and the danger that you end up with little strategic direction and strategic focus. Now, I would suggest we can learn a lot for those authorities where they have uh, brought about major improvement and focused that improvement. Um, but I would just conclude by saying that we've got to move away from not looking at outputs and simply looking at inputs. And I would, that would be the main criticism that I would level against the government today. Thank you. I appreciate members trying to keep to the four minutes. Please, George Adam, to be followed by John Pentland. Thank you, presiding officer. You know, our aim is to have an excellent and equitable education system, in which every young person across the country is able to achieve their full potential, regardless of their family circumstance or background that they're born into. And because I feel as if I've said something like that or something very similar on numerous occasions with the debates we've had, but that's because this is a very important debate. And it's one that we all may disagree on how we get to our achieved goal, but we all know it's one of the most important issues. And I think the First Minister in particular is to be uh, commended on making sure that this is a major issue. But the £100 million attainment Scotland Fund is rightly targeted at primary schools which serve our most deprived communities in Scotland. Because, presiding officer, for far too long, we've allowed parts of our uh, communities to fail in education over decades, over uh, years as well. You know, I've mentioned it before, and I, I take no pride in mentioning it again, that within my own constituency, there is an east-west divide, where you have one area where uh, there is uh, it's an area of deprivation, and uh, you have another area that uh, is obviously an, uh, an aspiring area, and people are doing a lot better financially. Now, that is making the difference with uh, the, how these young people actually attain and what they do within education. And uh, I believe that with the National Improvement Framework and the Attainment Advisors, we have the opportunity to ensure that we systematically get the resource to the right child at the right time within using these fr the framework and the advisors. Because for me, the Attainment Advisors' job will be to make sure that they get that resource. And it was also mentioned by Education Scotland when they came to the committee, they mentioned that they would, the attainment advisor's job would be to actually, if there was extra funding they needed or they needed extra resource, they would be able to find ways to do it either nationally and work with other local authorities in the area. I would love to, uh, Mr Gray, but I don't have much time uh, within the debate. Uh, so for me, that uh, shows that, that that job, that attainment advisor's position and uh, the framework itself is an important part of this debate and shows that the government is moving this argument forward. And the, the recent OECD report has been mentioned of Scotland's education system recognises the government's determination to focus on achieving both excellence and equity within our education system. Now, as I've already said, I don't doubt everybody's commitment uh, to try and close the attainment gap that we currently have, but the Scottish Government is already tackling this through the £100 million attainment fund. And during this week, uh, we had an informal session, which has already been mentioned by my colleague Mr MacArthur, uh, where we actually spoke to educationalists, and one said to me, £100 million is more than enough to achieve what we want to achieve. 
But what they want to do is how we get there, how we actually do it. And for me, that is a debate, is actually take the, prob the plans that we have here with the Scottish Government and how we move forward. But the team in Scotland Fund is already supporting more than 300 primary schools, which collectively serve 54,399 primary-aged children who live in the most deprived 20 per cent areas in Scotland. So 64 per cent of the total across Scotland. And we are well aware that those living, children living in poverty uh, do not just live in the 20 per cent uh, areas of Scotland. We have already mentioned that during this debate, and that is why there is included the 1.5 million Attainment Challenge Innovation Fund, which will support other schools across Scotland to explore and develop innovative approaches in raising attainment. One of the other things, uh, President Officer, that has already been mentioned as well, is the fact that the £230 million scheme, in these challenging times, the Government has still been able to actually invest £230 million to build 90 new schools. And, and when you're talking about targeting and how things are, you only have to look at one of these schools is St Fergus and Fergusley Park, which will be rebuilt. And that, to me, shows that the government is moving in the right way. There's still plenty of work to do, Must but complete. we need to rise up to this challenge and work together to make sure that we do this. Many thanks. And I now call John Pentland to be followed by Willie Coffey. For some reason, presiding officer, the SNP still want to be judged on the record. So, OK, let's do that. You know, after nine years of nationalist decline, I'd say the Cabinet Secretary's quote ought to be on a sugary peg. Does she, does anybody in the SNP think it's acceptable that young people from wealthier families are twice as likely to go to university, are seven times more likely to get three A's at higher, and are 12 times more likely to become a medical student? And can the Cabinet Secretary and the SNP really be taking comfort from an OECD report that notes that poor literacy of primary and secondary students and the decline in relative and absolute achievement levels in mathematics. And can you really take comfort that it says we might have a good system if it is strengthened with a stronger role for local authorities, i.e. less control by Scottish Government and more money for councils? And how can you and the SNP pretend that things are wonderful when we see the narrowing of the curriculum, the decline in modern language study and the lowest teacher number for 10 years. So in the face of such a mess, what does the Cabinet Secretary and the SNP do? It, re it reprofiles £500 million from council budgets. Its backbenchers, many ex-councillors, say nothing. Its councillors mutter but comply if, if in council control. If not, they blame the Council rather than the Scottish Government. Cabinet Secretary, in case you do not know, education is a huge proportion of Council spending, in some cases over 40 per cent. So you can't have such extensive cuts without harming education. Mr Pentland, can you address your remarks through the Chair, please, rather than directly to the Cabinet Secretary? Okay. Thank you. UK, UK cuts have been multiplied fivefold with devastating consequences for council services such as schools and childcare. This severely undermines any good done by the attainment fund. How much good that fund does is highly questionable when it ignores over 1,500 schools and 11 local authorities. Taking money away and then making a big fuss about giving some back is not a solution to anything other than a quest for publicity. The SNP is bereft of adequate answers, but what we do know, with over 6,000 Scottish children leaving primary unable to read properly, is that tackling the attainment gap must start in early years. Scottish Labour has set out proposals that would more effectively target those in most need. The Fair Start Fund would give primary schools £1,000 and nurseries £300 for every child from a deprived background. The money would go direct to head teachers to spend in whatever way is most appropriate to tackle the attainment gap in their school. The Scottish Government needs to take on board the advice of the OECD, its, po its poverty adviser and others who highlight its failings, no matter how unpalatable that may be. These failings must be recognised in order to be addressed. So sorting out the education system will require a degree of honesty that is rarely seen from this government. I will not hold my breath, Cabinet Secretary, but you could try being honest about your failures and then ask to be judged on your honesty. 
Thank you. And I now call Willie Coffey. Thanks very much, President Officer. The, this short debate will inevitably cover much of the ground that was covered a few weeks ago in the Scottish Government's education debate, but that's no bad thing, since it gives us an opportunity to highlight some of the many initiatives that are underway in our schools today. Uh, in Scotland, we currently spend about £5 billion every year uh, on our schools, despite UK budget cuts, and clearly raising the attainment of our young people in working to close those attainment gaps across Scotland is already a big part of that spend. And in Scotland, we already do spend significantly more on each pupil compared to, to England, for example. But there are a number of key programmes in place with additional funding attached that focus on many of these compelling issues around improving attainment. The £100 million attainment Scotland Fund, mentioned by several colleagues, is currently supporting over 300 primary schools and over 50,000 pupils from some of the most deprived communities in our country. There are a host of other Scotland-wide initiatives, such as the Challenge Innovation Fund, which also reaches out to our secondary schools, inviting them to come up with new and innovative approaches to closing the attainment gap. The Access to Education Fund tries to identify and reduce the barriers to learning that are often more pronounced within our disadvantaged communities, which I think is a, a crucial piece of work, presiding officer. Sometimes we might think that solutions to these key issues are to provide more and more money, but it can be as simple as providing a little support to youngsters to help them overcome the most basic of difficulties they face before they even arrive to open a book at school. There are other initiatives too, all of which are seeking to make a difference by giving our young people the crucial help that they need just to get on a level playing field with those who are perhaps more fortunate and to also steadily improve performance across our country in this pursuit of excellence. The independent OECD report confirms that improvements in attainment are taking place in Scotland. We are achieving scores in science and reading levels above international averages. We have record exam pass results and record numbers of school leavers who are working, who are in training or staying in education. The decline in maths that began under Labour has been stopped, and we have almost doubled the numbers of young folk from our most deprived communities who are getting at least one higher. These positive improvements have been recognised by the OECD and give us a solid foundation to build on. While the Ofsted report referred to in the motion uh, does record some positive differences being made in schools in England, it clearly says that it will take some time to establish whether that approach will lead to a narrowing of the attainment gap itself. The most recent analysis by the Demus think tank in February last year suggests that the attainment gap in England may in fact be widening, with more than half of England's authorities reporting as such in 2014. So, parachuting a completely untried scheme urgently into Scotland from England, as the Lib Dems want to do, whilst have our own programmes well underway, I think would be a ridiculous and dangerous thing to do. Presiding officer, if we are to achieve the step changes and improvements that we all seek and move beyond what the OECD report calls this watershed moment for education, we will need more than cash, new processes and assessment systems to help us get there. The report says we need to improve what it calls this middle area involving networking and collaboration. This, it says, will help us to achieve that new dynamic in learning and teaching that we actually need. Our new national improvement framework with a reliable and consistent evidence base for assessment at the heart of it and all of the current interventions in progress should give Scottish education the opportunity to realise the potential of being that world leader in education. Thank you. Many thanks. We now turn to the closing speeches and to call in Mary Scanlon. Four minutes, please. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Can I also thank the Liberal Democrats uh, for bringing forward this debate on educational attainment and uh, hopefully we move on towards uh, attainment and achievement. Uh, like my colleague Liz Smith, I take issue with the point in the motion stating that the Parliament, and I quote, recalls that the Liberal Democrats in the previous UK government successfully made the case for and introduced the pupil premium in 2011. Well, I'm afraid on this occasion the Lib Dems are just plain wrong. 
The pupil premium was in a Conservative policy paper as far back as 2007. It was also in the Conservative manifesto for the UK general election in 2010. So whatever claims the Liberal, Liberal Democrats have over their power and influence in the coalition government, they certainly cannot claim to have written the UK manifesto, although I appreciate that's what they're trying to do today. Uh, page 2051 of our manifesto for 2010, UK level, uh, is to raise standards in schools, and I quote, we will improve standards for all pupils and close the attainment gap between richest and poorest. As well as supporting our long-standing commitment to the pupil premium, I would also like to use this debate today uh, to look at the service pupil premium which, uh, of £300 per pupil, which is also available in England but not in Scotland. And according to the Armed Forces Covenant, Scotland has its own needs-based formula for service children which they have judged as more effective. So I thought I'll just phone Murray Council and ask what funding they get for service children there, especially when the, we've got the Royal Engineers Regiment at Kinloss and children of the Royal Air Force personnel at Lossiemouth. So I asked the convener of Murray Council uh, what is given in Scotland compared to the £300 per pupil in England, and the answer was nothing. Mm. So if the money is used in England so that new pupil joiners to a school receive a proper induction, including initial assessment to avoid any potential gaps in their coverage of the cu uh, curriculum, if it's good enough for England, for children of defence families, why isn't it good enough in Scotland? Uh, and while the Lib Dems claim that the pupil premium grant was their idea, I would also add that the budget is now four times greater than it was at the time of introduction in 2016. Uh, and that is certainly not to Lib Dem, due to any Lib Dem input, both at the moment or in the future. And much has been said today about the Scottish system and the English system. And I think it's very, I don't think anyone comes up with a system and on day one it's perfect. So I'm very pleased to hear that uh, a Labour MP, Frank Field, uh, supported by two Conservatives, is now seeking an early day motion to look at ways to improve the identification of children with low attainment so that the, more children can be eligible for the pupil premium. And I think that's a grown-up way of looking forward. And also, the UK Public Accounts Committee, uh, I've, I've, uh, chaired by a Labour MP, is also calling for improvements to identify pupils in need. And I think that's also the right way forward and it should not be aligned to party politics. So, presiding officer, there have been serious criticisms of the nationalist government approach to closing the attainment gap. And despite the Lib Dems trying to rewrite history in their favour, this has been a helpful contribution to the ongoing debate on attainment and I hope in future achievement. Many thanks. And I now call in Mark Griffin. Maximum four minutes, please, Mr Griffin. Thank you, President Officer, and I welcome this opportunity to contribute to this uh, debate again, one which has shown there is cross-party consensus and growing on tackling the attainment gap, but not necessarily on the methods, although, as I've noted earlier, the, the methods, the, there doesn't seem to be much difference between ours and the one proposed in the Lib Dem motion. And, and I'm encouraged that all sides of the Chamber are committed to ensuring that educational inequality is a top priority for this and for future um, parliaments that have been set out in parties' manifestos. Um, it's been pointed out admirably by members that there is a gap in attainment between children from poorer backgrounds and those from more affluent circumstances. But the report card for the Scottish Government after eight years does not make comfort in reading. A pupil entering primary one when the SNP began running our education system will now be hitting high school. And in, in that time, this group of pupils have borne the brunt of education budget cuts, fallen teacher numbers, and the rising attainment gap, watching their classmates from wealthier families pull away from them. So we welcome the, the government's ambition to close the attainment gap, but there is a big question mark 
over how that will be achieved. The Scottish Attainment Fund um, should be used to close the gap, but thousands of pupils across the country miss out on support. Under the SNP plans, more than 1,500 schools in Scotland get no extra support to close the gap between the richest and the rest. With half a billion pounds of cuts to local services, like our schools, coming from the government's budget, there is a real risk that pupils already at a disadvantage will get left even further behind. Now, on this side, we believe that there is action um, beyond what the government is proposing that can make a difference. In the, the coming years, this parliament will have a substantial suite of new powers which will open up new choices in education. We would use the additional revenues from a new 50p tax rate on top earners in the country to redistribute money from those who can afford it um, to those who need it most by investing additional resources over and above the government's proposals in tackling educational disadvantage. The, the SNP government's budget um, yet again slashes the funding for local schools, which will make the problem even worse. And we would use the, the Parliament's new powers to introduce a Fair Start fund, which would give every primary school an extra £1,000, every nursery an extra £300 for every pupil from a deprived family. Now, that money would go... Uh, sorry, uh, in a very short debate, I'd, I'd normally would. Um, that money would go directly to head teachers. Um, that difference um, from the pupil premium scheme that we've already seen in place in England, so that they choose from a chosen, um, they get to choose from a suite of proven methods. Um, they make sure um, that they spend that money in the best way as they see fit in their local circumstances to close that attainment gap between the richest and the rest. Now, uh, as I've said, we would we would use that additional revenue from a, a new 50p top rate tax to redistribute resources from those earning over £150,000 a year to those who need it most. Um, that is over and above what the government have already committed to tackling the educational attainment gap. I think it would be a shame, President Officer, given the, the consensus around tackling issues, um, the weight of support that we've found here for class, please. the educational challenges that, again, if this opportunity were to pass us by for us to put more resources into schools to tackle this problem. Thank you. Many thanks. And I now call on Angela Constance. Minister, you have up to six minutes, Cabinet Secretary, please. Thank you, President Officer. How we ensure that resources, services, opportunities reach the children most in need is indeed a central, it's a, a fundamental question of how we deliver education in Scotland. And all targeting has to be done in the context of a, a strengthened universal offer. There are pros and cons with all forms of targeting. And the danger with any form of targeting, if done in isolation, is that you miss your target, is that you miss the point. So getting that right blend of approach is absolutely crucial. And the bigger prize, per perhaps later, Ms Smith, the, the bigger prize is about how you ensure that universal service, that £4.8 billion investment in education, how that provides more for all children so to maximise the impact of additional more targeted measures. And what we do and how we do it is important as well as what we invest. And our approach through the Scottish Attainment Challenge and the Attainment Scotland Fund, which is £100 million over four years, as I've indicated earlier, is targeting additional funding at local authorities and individual schools with the highest concentration of children growing up in areas of deprivation. And these schools and these local authorities reach out to 54,000 children, two-thirds of Scotland's poorest children. And of course we accept that poorest children don't always live in the poorest areas. We also know that if you target children and young people in accordance with free school meals and there are many cases where we do and should do that but we will know there will be other children in struggling families that will just miss out so that right blend of targeting 
and universality is absolutely imperative. And we must, throughout our education system, get the right approach through collaboration. And in terms of the approach through the attainment challenge, uh, we have attainment advisors in every local authority who will knit together and spread that invaluable experience and learning that has been pioneered in the attainment challenge areas to ensure that it is spread throughout the countries. And this is an approach that is not new to Scotland because we have the Raising Attainment for All programme, we have the Early Years Collaborative, the Schools Improvement uh, Partnership programme, and many authorities, the authorities that are most successful in tackling deprivation in our schools, have been at the vanguard of a clustered approach, uh, schools working with each other, and of course, local authorities uh, working with each other. And what we know, you wouldn't take me earlier, Mr Gray, I don't want to seem churlish, but no thanks. Um, <laughs> what we have made clear through the Scottish Attainment Challenge is that where there are a shared campus, and admittedly, if you have two schools serving two different catchment areas, uh, as we have in many, in the school that I uh, grew up in, the school that I went to was, was one of those schools, but we are encouraging schools with shared campuses to share resources and approaches because we know that not all children live in those areas identified uh, as poor. And the interest of this government and what motivates myself and the First Minister and the team of education ministers is on what works. I am not interested in lazy ideology. I am not interested in what has always been. I am interested in what works. And the evidence around the pupil premium at best is mixed. And I had to you know, wonder if we were actually talking about the same National Audit Office report, because it very clearly said that some schools in England with very poor pupils actually had less money now uh, per pupil. Whereas in Scotland, we continue to have higher spending per head, per pupil, uh, in comparison. Uh, £4,899 uh, per head per primary school pupil compared to £4,500 uh, per pupil in England. And similarly, in secondary schools, uh, over £6,600 per head. Compare that with £6,000 uh, south of the border. And the same National Audit Office report also very pointedly remarked on a, a real terms funded per pupil had decreased in almost half of the schools between 2011 and 14. And Mr Pentland's um, rather um, downbeat contribution certainly gives me an opportunity to talk about Labour's uh, record. His time in office, perhaps not him personally, but his party's time in office, aided and abetted by the Liberals at the time, is littered with examples of not meeting their own targets and then dumping them. And what we are doing in this government is we are not being afraid to be ambitious. Uh, in terms of how we measure the attainment gap in Scotland, we are comparing the 20% most deprived with the 20% least deprived. South of the border, how they measure the attainment gap is the 20% most deprived with the rest, the remaining 80%. So the task that we have set ourselves, presiding officer, is far, far higher. And it was under Labour's watch that we've seen a decline in our international standing in accordance uh, with the, the, the PISA. And it took this government, Mr Pentland, to halt uh, that close, decline. And we won't be taking any lessons from Tories and Liberals, the architects of austerity welfare cuts and rising uh, child poverty. And my final point, presiding officer, can I say, to, mis can I say to Mr Rowley, 607 schools rebuilt or refurbished yep. under this government. That compares, Mr Pentland, to 328 under your collective watch. Many thanks. Now, Colin Willie Rennie to wind up the debate. Mr Rennie, up to eight minutes, please. Yeah, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I'm not going to argue with Mary Scanlon. I think, I, I think it's unwise to argue with such a, an eloquent member of this chamber. But what is clear is that we have got a consensus almost across the chamber in favour of targeted support to those children who need it. Support. And the intellectual gymnastics 
of the Education Secretary. I think we we'll have to pay tribute to her. Her <laughs> ability to try and explain, but then not explain, why all kids don't get the support that they absolutely need by somehow saying that we need to concentrate on areas that have the most poor kids. What about all the other kids in East Renfrewshire, in Kilmarnock and in Paisley who are deprived of the funds? Because I didn't hear those members speak up for those children, but I'm sure those children and those parents and those schools are not happy about not getting the funds that they deserve. Because I believe, unlike it seems many members in this chamber on the SNP benches, that every child deserves the chance to get up and get on. Not just every child who happens to be in the right area that the SNP decide is the appropriate area to invest the funds in. This is not some bureaucratic exercise. This is about giving kids a chance to get up and get on. And the evidence is clear that we are making progress on the pupil premium in England. The National Audit Office and Ofsted have both said there's evidence. But the SNP members prefer to rely on evidence that does not exist at all in favour of some attainment fund that they've just started, as stronger evidence to support their scheme. There is no evidence for the SNP scheme. There is evidence for the scheme, the pupil premium, and there is support across this chamber in favour of the pupil premium. And I think, actually, Ian Gray was right. We have learnt about the pupil premium process as it's gone on. I think Kirsty Williams, my colleague in Wales, was at the forefront of arguing that it should be introduced in Wales. And they learnt the lessons from in England to make sure that the scheme developed um, in Wales was even better than that. And equally, in England, they are learning about the process as well. And you cannot deny that between the years 2011 and 2014, there was a 4.7% closure of the gap in attainment at primary schools. That's pretty clear. And actually, Liz Smith was very good at actually highlighting some of the other evidence in terms um, of uh, the trusts in England that have been looking at the pupil premium and the, the evidence to support its implementation. So I think um, the SNP, rather than adopting a scheme that's working, preferred to adopt a brand new scheme so they can call it uh, their own, which is disappointing because it misses out on 36% of the kids who deserve the support. The, I was amused by Stuart Maxwell. I don't think he really meant to say crisis, what crisis? Um, the words that almost brought down, in fact, did bring down the Callaghan government in 79. But that was effectively what he was saying. But he ignored the widening attainment gap in Scotland, as highlighted by the OECD report, which also highlighted that Scotland, one of the world's best education systems in the past, is now slipping down the league tables. He ignored that. He ignored the fact that when the Education Secretary, not just now, when the, no, not just now, when the Education Secretary said that 27% of two-year-olds would get nursery education, and now only 7% of them get it. He ignored that figure as well. And he also ignored the fact of the colossal, whopping, massive cut that's about to be imposed on councils of £500 million. Half of what councils do is education. If he's saying that's not a crisis, then I'm afraid I completely disagree with them, and that shows how the SNP are increasingly complacent about the education system in Scotland. And that's why we have proposed today an urgent investment in education with a penny on tax for education. We will say, we will say where the money comes from very clearly. £475 million investment for a transformational change in education in Scotland. These people can sit on their hands, but we are going to make the investment in education that pupils deserve. And that money will be invested in clear areas. The pupil premium, the pupil premium which is shown to work in England. Colleges, 152,000 places cut over the last few years by this SNP government, which has deprived so many people on part-time courses, as well as many full-time courses, older people, deprived places, that we will repair some of the damage on that too. We will stop the cuts to education through our schools. We will make sure that the SNP do not get their way on cutting the budget. We will also invest in expanding. He has an awful lot to say, Mr Waxwell, but when it comes to it, he does not deliver. The reality is that what we need to do is also invest in nursery education because it has been shown to be the best educational investment that we can make. If you look at 
the, some, of the, some of the experts across the globe have said, if you invest before the age of three, you can actually change their life chances for the rest of their life. That's why we need to invest in the pupil premium. We need to invest in nursery education. We need to invest in our colleges, not just to give kids the chance to get up and get on in the world, but also to provide the skills for industry. Because there is a massive skills gap in this country. It was just in Aberdeen last week who were saying there is still a skills gap. Despite the fall in the oil price, there's a skills gap in that area. We need to invest to fill the skills gap to make the difference for the future. So this is about giving everybody the opportunity to get up and go on and improving the economy. That's why we are proposing a penny on tax for education. And for those who say it's not progressive, that it actually hits the poorest the hardest, it's complete and utter nonsense. If you look at somebody who is earning £100,000, they will pay 30 times more than somebody on the median wage in Scotland. That is progressive. And what we've seen from the SNP, because despite the grand words um, from the Education Secretary and, his, and her deputy um, about having excellence and having bold measures, they actually often talk left but walk right. They never actually follow through on the rhetoric. And that's why, that's why the challenge is now that's why the challenge has now been laid down to the SNP administration. If they really believe in changing the life chances of the people in their constituencies and in my constituency, then they would adopt this bold measure, this progressive measure to invest in education, to change the life chances, to improve the economy. If they really believe that and aren't just hiding behind the constitutional argument so they don't have to take any action at all to change the life chances of people, then they can adopt that approach if they wish. But we will not follow them. draw to a close, please. Uh, thank you, uh, Deputy President Officer. To remind me, I am almost concluding. The most important aspect here is that we look in terms of investment in education, because we have seen from the SNP administration an enormous <coughs> assault on the education system. They may say it's not a crisis. They may poo-poo the ideas of a pupil premium. They may fail to deliver on nursery education. But Liberal Democrats will not. We'll put forward the proposals and we will fund them. Thank you. Many thanks. And that concludes the debate on education. It's now time to move on to the next item of business, which is a debate on motion number 15432 in the name of Jim Hume on fuel poverty. I invite members who wish to speak in this debate to please press the request to speak buttons now or as soon as possible. And Mr Hume, if you are ready, uh, up to 10 minutes, please, tight for time. Officer, as we speak, there are approximately 1.8 million people in Scotland, that's 35% of all Scottish households, 1.8 million that are in fuel poverty this winter. Of those households, 9.5% are in extreme fuel poverty, requiring more than 20% of their income to pay for fuel. Some even have to make the tough choice between paying for tomorrow's breakfast or turning the heating on for another hour because they cannot afford to have both. This is a trade-off that no one should have to face in this day and age in Scotland. It's a trade-off that hasn't improved in the last two years and it's a trade-off that the Scottish Government has a duty to remove from every single household. Yet what the administration has done has led to no real change to the fuel poverty level in 2014 from the year before. Uh, the year before. Instead, the Scottish Government again blames others, points the finger and states it has little control over fuel price changes, while failing to recognise that its own target is not going to be met. This Government argument that it uh, doesn't have power over fuel uh, prices and is content with pointing the finger on the rise in fuel poverty to everything but its inaction is like saying that if people don't get sick, then the health system would be able to reach all its targets. But, just like any administration, uh, we'd be working flat out to contain an imminent threat to public health. Why is this government not working flat out to contain the threat to public health that is fuel poverty? It's a deeply disappointing stance to see. The denial of the facts on the ground can only cause more problems and no, and no solutions. 
Some of the most recent fuel price increases have been mitigated by increased incomes, but what about those whose incomes remain below the income poverty line and those who are over the income poverty line but are still in fuel poverty? It begs the question whether the definition of fuel poverty needs to be updated, and that's a recommendation given by the independent adviser on poverty and inequality in her report last week to the First Minister. That report stated over half of all fuel all fuel poor households probably wouldn't be classified as income poor. The fuel poverty definition, I think, needs to be looked at again. So that future programme uh, focus uh, more specifically on helping those in fuel poverty who are also in income poverty. And apart from differences in income, there are also major regional differences that we need, need to address. As the Labour Amendment rightly points out, rural areas and island communities across Scotland are suffering because of cold homes. The latest figures clearly show the disproportionate impact of fuel poverty on rural areas. It's a shameful reminder to this government of their record on the issue. 43 of Scottish Borders households, 45% in Dumfries and Galloway, 58% in Orkney and 62% of Western Isles households, households were in fuel poverty in 2013. So when people's incomes, health and comfort in, are in danger, we should all be putting aside our political differences and work to address these problems. And hopefully we'll hear some cross-party support here. Mike McKenzie. I'm, I'm very glad that you indicated that, um, to a large extent, this is beyond the control of the go uh, Scottish Government, not having any control over energy prices. But would you also agree with me that the UK Government's curtailment of eco and abandoning the Green Deal also have a huge bearing on this problem? Jim Hume? I, I, I'll disagree with the, the member in the fact that it's actually the Scot this Scottish Government that's proposing a 13% cut to addressing uh, fuel poverty, which I'll come on to in, in due course. Scottish Lib Dems want to build cross-party support like we've never seen before and with comments like that probably we'll never see. But this Scottish Government amendment represents a deviation from this cross-party support and remains complacent in tackling the issue decisively, an issue that leads to suffering, stress and poor health. But as I say, the issue should cross party lines, and I'm almost certain uh, that there will be support of any initiatives and measures that lead to this. The Minister's motion uh, talks up installing energy efficiency measures in 14,000 homes, but when 845,000 households are in fuel poverty, it should explain to the other 831,000 households why this is such a great improvement. Last June, the Scottish Government announced that energy efficiency would be a national infrastructure priority. Eight months on, we have heard close to nothing on the details of any plan. So I expect that this information will be eagerly received by all who suffer from fuel poverty. And I would like to invite the Minister to address this and provide more details in her remarks this afternoon. I am also supportive of, of uh, many other schemes, such as ensuring that new-built homes, as well as social landlords, adhere to and are supported by stronger energy efficiency standards. But there's a lot more that we could do. This Scottish Government refusing to acknowledge that it is set to miss its fuel poverty target by November, I think would be a starting point. As recently as last week, the Minister for Housing and Welfare told my colleague, uh, Liam MacArthur, and I quote, the Scottish Government has no current plans to reassess the fuel poverty target. While of course in last year, in October, the Cabinet Secretary for Social Justice reassured himself of having, of having another year to reach the target. <laughs> Meanwhile, after the successful Paris climate change talks, my colleague Tavis Scott has asked the Minister for Environment to provide details in his question to her. The Minister has not even written to Mr Scott yet, and I would like to invite her, in her absence, to write to him as soon as possible. Not only does the Scottish Government uh, constant denial add insult to injury for the millions in cold homes, but the proposed 13 per cent cut in fuel poverty spending is simply counterproductive. I know the uh, Minister may protest on this, but just two days ago she said, and I quote, that the Scottish Government has not proposed to reduce the domestic energy efficiency budget by 13 per cent, and that we have allocated 103 million to tackle fuel poverty and climate change in this year. And I remember her so I again remind her of the answer that the Cabinet Secretary for Social Justice gave to this chamber three months ago when he said, and I quote, this year we are spending £119 million 
£1.5 on dealing with fuel poverty. And that was replicated by the Minister on the Environment last month uh, in answering a ta Tavish Scott's question, a topical question, where she also stated that it was £119 million. £119 million this year, £103 million next year, a £16 million slash, a 13% 13 13 cut. That's disproportionate, that's regressive. It's not just bad for people's pockets, but for their health, and leads to further pressures on our precious NHS. A cold home is neither conducive to good health uh, nor a satisfactory learning environment for any child, uh, to quote the Commission on Housing and Wellbeing. It's indefensible that cold, hard-to-heat homes continue to leave the most vulnerable in our society at the mercy of cold weather each winter. Not my words, but the words of the Director of the Royal College of Nurses. And the WWF points to the worst figures of winter deaths in more than a decade. Deputy Presiding Officer, when nearly half of pensioner couples live in fuel poverty, as Age Scotland warns, it's pivotal that we rethink our approach. When senior citizens are hospitalised with aggravated heart diseases, strokes and flu, we need to look at what the preventable causes are and prevent them. When people old and young alike are facing increased risk for mental health problems because they are unable to live in a warm, comfortable environment, we should be more proactive in our prevention strategy. Edison himself once said that the doctor of the future will give no medication but will interest his patients in the care of the human frame, diet and in the cause and prevention of disease. How true and appropriate about 100 years later to tackle fuel poverty and cold homes today. Last year, the National Institute for Health and Care Excellence pub published its recommendations for dealing with health, risk, health risks associated with cold homes. So I look forward to hearing from the Minister whether any of these recommendations are being taken on by the Scottish Intercollegiate Guidelines Network and what progress there is. Deputy Presiding Officer, the debate that the Scottish Liberal Democrats have, have brought to this chamber today is one that requires us to look realistically uh, at the ugly truth of the condition of our homes in Scotland. Fuel poverty is not just a matter of infrastructure or energy or technology. It's a matter of providing people across Scotland, old and young, rural and urban, with the security they need to have a fulfilling and comfortable life, a brighter, healthier life for Scots, and the reduction of the burden on the already hard-pressed NHS. All can be achieved by tackling fuel poverty. This government needs to think outside the box, spend to save, spend to reduce fuel poverty and spend to reduce the financial burden on the NHS. We are urging all parties to commit their efforts in easing the burden of those families on the lowest incomes who pay the biggest share on heating. So I call on the Scottish Government to reverse the fuel poverty spending cut, join the other parties in reassessing its 2016 fuel poverty Dr. target Dr. Close, set by this Parliament and commit to additional measures that will enjoy cross-party support to achieve a warmer, a healthier home for every person in Scotland. I move the motion in my name. Many thanks. I call on Margaret Burgess to speak to and move Amendment 15432.3. Minister, you have up to seven minutes, please. Okay. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. And I welcome the opportunity to take part in this debate. And I agree on some of what Jim Hume has said, and one is that Scotland is an energy-rich country and there is no room in Scotland for fuel poverty. Tackling inequality is at the heart of this Scottish Government's commitment to create a fairer country for all, and nothing is more important to me and to this Government than responding to the real pressures that individuals and families face across Scotland, and there is no complacency whatsoever about that. We know that fuel poverty is a real issue for thousands of households in Scotland struggling to pay fuel bills and keep their homes warm. And we've seen more and more people being pushed into fuel poverty as they've tried to cope with unaffordable and rising fuel prices over the last few years. Powers over the regulation of the energy market remain reserved to the UK Government. But I can assure you the Scottish Government is doing all we can through taking action on the one contributing factor to fuel poverty that we do have control over, which is energy efficiency. I'll take a small intervention. Jim Hume. 
the Minister said that this government is doing everything it can, but we have had the Cabinet Secretary and one of your Ministers state that £119 million was going into tackling fuel poverty, and that is in, within just over a month has been reduced now to £103 million. That is a 13 per cent disproportionate cut. Uh, could the Minister explain? Minister. I will explain, and I have explained before. Um, in this current year, we are spending 100, and we set aside £119 million for fuel poverty. And in that £119 million included £15 million of consequentials we received from the UK Government for um, their, their Green Homes Improvement Scheme. And with no warning to the Scottish Government and no consultation with the Scottish Government, they stopped that scheme, which meant we did not get that £15 million. We also had our overall budget cut by the UK Government. So if Jim Hume or anyone else in this chamber can tell us where to get that £15 million within our existing budgets, and we have asked you this question before, then we are willing to listen. But that is the reason why that £15 million is no longer available. We have maintained the rest of the budget, the £103 million, as we said. Uh, and no one has yet come across and said where to find that £15 million that has been taken from the Scottish Government budget. And since 2009, we have allocated over half a billion pounds to make Scotland's homes more energy efficient. And over 700,000 households have received assistance to help them heat their homes affordably. And most of these are our most vulnerable households. I have already said about the £119 million budget allocation for 2015, and around 80% is grant funding and targeted at the poorest households in Scotland to make their homes warmer and cheaper to heat. I will give way briefly. Brown. I'm grateful to the Minister for giving way. Since the draft budget was published in December, on how many occasions has the Minister formally requested more money for fuel poverty from the Deputy First Minister? Minister? We have a uh, the budget overall to Scotland has been cut, and we got the same allocation this year as we had last year. There's pressures on all the budgets, and what I'm going to say is, I, yes, I heard what you, I heard what was asked, uh, presiding officer. But what I'm saying is, his government in the UK cut our overall budget, took 15 million pounds away from our fuel poverty budget, and Gavin Brown is now asking us to find that money again. And I would say to Gavin Brown and others, show us in the budget where to find that £15 million. Tell us where. We heard I come in here. No, presiding officer, I'm, I'm taking no more interventions. I come in to hear the Liberals shouting for more money for education. I'm now hearing them shouting for more money uh, for fuel poverty. What I'm saying to them is, show us where to get that money in a fixed budget. They can do that. We'll consider it in detail. So, presiding officer, we are con continuing to demonstrate our commitment to tackle fuel poverty head on by maintaining the expenditure available in the budgets we have under our control. And it has been a very tough financial climate. All of the increases in fuel poverty since the target was introduced can be explained by above inflation energy price increases. And our figures indicate that if fuel prices had only risen in line with inflation between 2002 and 2014, the fuel poverty rate for 2014 would have been around 9.5 per cent instead of 35 per cent. And the latest statistics have shown that without our sustained and long-term commitment of funding, the figure would be much higher. And we're also looking very carefully at the recommendation from the poverty adviser that Jim Hume referred to uh, in uh, his opening remarks. We have said we would listen, we'd look carefully at all of our recommendations and respond to each and every one of them. But our long-term investment is helping to improve the energy efficiency of Scotland's homes. The share of homes rated EPC band C and above has increased by 71 per cent since 2010 and by 11 per cent in the last year. And this is helping reduce greenhouse gas emissions while helping people heat their homes. Our record in energy efficiency demonstrates that it's always been a priority for this government because we know that it's the most sustainable way of keeping energy bills affordable and cutting greenhouse gas emissions. And that's why we've designated energy efficiency a national infrastructure priority and committed to the development of Scotland's energy efficiency programme, SEEP for short. I, I can't, I'm in my last minute, sorry. 
Work to develop SEEP is underway and we continue to engage with stakeholders, including the Fuel Poverty Strategic Working Group, and believe that this is a real opportunity to transform our approach to retrofitting existing buildings across Scotland. SEEP will, for the first time, integrate action on domestic and non-domestic energy efficiency and look for opportunities to develop district heat networks. Through this new programme, we are committed to continuing our support for vulnerable households, but we also want it to be the norm for every household and business across Scotland to invest in energy efficiency improvements. And to help us achieve this, we will seek to leverage private investment to support the development of loan schemes to help households and businesses. I will bring it to a close, uh, Presiding Officer. Uh, to conclude, I have set out in my remarks what the Scottish Government has done, is doing and plans to do in the future to tackle fuel poverty. And I believe this demonstrates our firm commitment to improving energy efficiency and eradicating fuel poverty in Scotland. Many thanks. Now call on Ken McIntosh to speak to and move Amendment 15432.2. Mr McIntosh, up to five minutes, please. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. At last year, the number of excess winter deaths in Scotland was the highest in more than a decade, at a staggering 4,060. Excess winter deaths. It's an uncomfortable phrase. But it means the number of people who die during the winter months compared to the average throughout the rest of the year. The World Health Organization suggests that at least 30% of those 4,000 extra deaths can be attributed to cold, damp housing. Now, I say all this simply to highlight how much fuel poverty matters. For some people, high bills are a source of annoyance. For others, they mean a real struggle to balance competing financial demands. For others still, they lead to choices which can prove fatal. The existing Homes Alliance highlight that spending time in a cold, damp house can aggravate conditions such as heart disease, strokes and flu, and increase the risk of mental health problems, as well as the increased risk of illness and death among older people, young children, and those with a disability. As the Liberal Democrat motion before us this afternoon highlights, more than a third of Scottish households live in fuel poverty. That is, they need to spend more than 10% of their income on gas, electricity or fuel bills. One in 10 is in extreme poverty, having to spend 20% of their income just to keep warm. These are damning figures. And when we look at the statistics in more detail, they're even more worrying. More than half the people affected are pensioners, more than 70% live in social or private rented accommodation. As always, it is the most vulnerable in our society who suffer the most. Presenting officer, it was all so different 15 years ago. In 2001, the then Liberal uh, Labour administration led the way, apparently winning support from the SNP in saying we can abolish this blight in our society and setting the target to end fuel poverty entirely by November this year. We were united in our expectation that our political commitment could make a real difference. How many of us could have predicted that after nine years of SNP government, we would have gone into reverse, not abolishing fuel poverty, but increasing it? Nine years after coming to power, the SNP's record is that a third of all Scots come home to a cold, damp house. If you live... I will do for Mr Don. Nigel Don. Uh, I, I'm very grateful to the member. I'm just wondering what fraction of those who he's just mentioned in drawing up that target expected fuel prices to increase quite disproportionately over the period. Ken McIntosh. Either you sign up to these targets and you claim credit as you constantly do for the work you're doing or, you're not, or not at all. And this, I have to say, I expected better from Mr Don with these pathetic excuses that we're hearing from the SNP today. The amendment today from the Scottish Government trying to excuse any responsibility or culpability is one of the most feeble and apologetic we have ever witnessed. Yet again, it is all either the UK Government's fault or the power companies or nothing to do with us, Gov. We've done all we could. But of course, and I'll point this out to Mr Don, we discovered, sneaked out in the budget in fact, that the SNP is not doing all it could. Far from it. As Alan Ferguson, Chair of the Existing Homes Alliance, said... Just a day after we learned there has been no progress in reducing the 35% of Scottish households living in fuel poverty, we discovered the draft budget for ending cold homes is less than was available this year. So we unearthed this fact 
Despite the fact that the Scottish Government tried to cover its tracks by comparing two sets of draft figures rather than using the final or outturn figures for the year, the SNP published figures suggesting an increase of 14 million. But as SPICE, the Parliament's own entirely independent research, has revealed, using the final budget figures, the truth is that Scotland faced a reduction of around £15 million. Now, the sector, those who have to deal with the day-to-day -day problems caused by inadequate housing, have not been fooled by the SNP's inadequate response. John Swinney's decision, I will in a second, John Swinney's budget decision did not just come out the day after these terrible fuel poverty figures, it came a week after the First Minister flew back from the International Climate Change Conference in Paris, claiming to have embedded climate change in the SNP draft budget. I would be delighted to hear Mr Mackenzie explain this one away. Mike Mackenzie. I am very grateful to Mr McIntosh for taking the intervention. This SNP government has spent over half a billion pounds in fuel poverty measures since 2009. I would be very interested to hear from Mr McIntosh how much uh, Labour would have spent over that period, how much he suggests we spend within this budget, um, and what would he cut? What would he cut in order to achieve the spending um, Mr. necessary Mr. to Mr. eradicate Mr. fuel Well, I, I thought the amendment was feeble. The intervention is even worse. Can I, can I suggest, as the government, along with the Liberal Democrats, that set this target, our commitment to fuel poverty and the, the central heating programme, the, the uh, allowance, the winter fuel allowances, our record on fuel poverty is absolutely there for all to you see. To and compared to your please. record, the SNP's record, presiding officer, this is not just a social problem. It's not just about poverty. It's about the environment too. Presenting officer, may I end on this note? It's very fitting that we're having this, this debate in January. Janus, the two-faced god of, of Roman times. And I have to say, I hope Mr Mackenzie goes away and reads his, his Roman history to learn a lesson there too. Now call on Gavin Brown. Up to five minutes, Mr Brown, as you speak to and move Amendment 15432.1. Thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. Can I start by uh, moving the amendment in my name and uh, congratulating the Liberal Democrats on bringing forward this extremely important debate and something that has become, I think, a bit of an Achilles heel uh, for the Scottish Government. Because the amendment they've laid down and the contributions we've had today so far, I have to say, have been pathetic. They have been a very feeble and lame tale from a government whose record in this area is genuinely poor. That's not just political speak. In an objective sense, it has been poor. Because it's absolutely clear to anyone who can count that we will miss this target. It's absolutely clear that we will miss this target by some considerable distance. And it's absolutely clear that there is not a plan from this government in order to rectify that failure. It is simply business as usual. Not a hint of regret from the Scottish Government. They want us to recognise their commitment. They want to blame the UK Government. They want to blame the energy companies. And here was my favourite one. If only fuel increases had risen in line with inflation in every single year between the years of 2002 and 2014, um, we still would have missed the target. But just by not quite as much as we're actually going to miss a target. And they have the audacity in closing their amendment to say that they have a long-term commitment to tackling fuel poverty head-on. Well, I have to say, if that is the Scottish Government tacking it, tackling it in the long-term head-on, then I would genuinely hate to see anything that they're not tackling head-on. And we'll probably hear from Nicola Sturgeon at, at First Minister's questions tomorrow or next week that they're not going to fail to meet the target, presenting officer. They're sim simply going to reprofile the target. And that, that way, that way they will have met uh, the target quite carefully. Now, it's perfectly acceptable, it's perfectly fair, I think, as uh, Mr Mackenzie said, that there are areas within the target over which they don't have direct control. OK, energy prices are not controlled by the Scottish Government, uh, wages are not controlled by the Scottish Government, but in 2007, when they came into this Government, they accepted that target in its entirety. They didn't make excuses. They didn't say, we'll accept this target as long as energy prices don't rise and as long as wages uh, rise in line with inflation. They accepted that target. They have accepted that target in every year since becoming government, and therefore they have taken responsibility for it and are ulti ultimately accountable for the failure. They cannot blame 
the fact that prices have gone up with a few months to go for failing to meet the target, when that has been apparent for some time. I will give a name check, Mr. I better give away to, to, the, to uh, Mr. McKenzie. Mr. McKenzie. I am very grateful to the member for taking an intervention. I have a great deal of respect for Mr Brown's financial literacy. I wonder, therefore, if he could lay out the Conservative plans for eradicating fuel poverty and tell me how much is that going to cost and what part of the Scottish budget would you cut in order to achieve that? Mr Brown. If, if two bad inter interventions don't make the point, try three, appears to be Mike McKenzie's approach. Very clearly, okay, I sat on a cross-party committee with some of his colleagues, who, uh, some of whom are in the chamber today, and it was apparent to the Economy, Energy and Tourism Committee in 2009 that we needed a sea change. We produced a report. All of us signed up to a sea change, listening to experts like Energy Action Scotland. And we were told by the then minister that the Scottish Government has produced a sea change. They were putting in place measures to, in 2009 that were going to create this sea change over time. And it clearly and quite simply hasn't happened. We heard earlier today about the number of households in fuel poverty, but not only are we failing to meet the target, we have gone backwards. When this government came into power, 26.5% of households were in fuel poverty. Today, it's 34.9%. In 2007, 7.6% of households were in extreme fuel poverty. Today, it's 9.5%. So it's been pretty obviously obvious that we have not been on track for quite some time. And what the government has failed to do is to put the money behind it. In 2009-10, they put in £68.3 million. It was obvious then we weren't moving towards a target. So they increased it to £68.5 million. Then they cut it to £58 million, then it went to 67 and then 66. It remained broadly static for a five-year period when it was obvious we were failing to meet those targets, Deputy Presiding Officer. Now, yes, uh, they did increase it in 14-15. Uh, yes, they did increase it last year. But now that it's blatantly obvious we're not going to hit the target, what are they doing? They're cutting it once again. And I have to say I was genuinely disappointed when I asked the Minister quite simply on how many occasions has she asked the Deputy First Minister for more money? On how many times has she tried to champion the cause to make sure that she's fighting for the space and the resources that it deserves? The answer to all listening was none. It's pretty obvious that the Minister close, hasn't please. asked a single time since the draft budget was published for more resources for something which she claimed in her speech, where she said nothing is more important. Let's Deputy Signing Officer, a huge disappointment from the Scottish Government. Thank you. Now move to open debate speeches. Uh, up to four minute speeches for the four open debate speakers, please. Rob Gibson to be followed by Claudia Beamish. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Well, if you left uh, the fuel poor to the Tories' care, then they are not going to get anything uh, to help them see through a winter. And as for listening to the economical with the truth, uh, Liberal Democrats. I have to say it's sickening because the realities are very different from the picture that they paint. There is no one size fits all. There is no sense for one minute that uh, the problem is solved in a simple way because it's much more complex than they say. And I can assure you that I'm going to talk about some of these effects in my constituency without intervention. My constituency in Sutherland has some of the most fuel poor, fuel, fuel poor people in the country, and also uh, one of the areas with the uh, lowest income quartile. They have to buy off-grid gas from, uh, uh, tank, from uh, tanks. They have to pay two pence more for electricity in the grid. They have, till recently, had to pay more for petrol and diesel. They have to pay extra charges for parcel delivery. All of these add to the ability of people to decide whether they are going to invest in the ways that they can improve their homes. And that's something which must be taken into account in this debate. Because crying about the fact that there's a one particular measure that uh, you disagree with doesn't take into account many of these factors over which we have absolutely no control. Now, in the UK Parliament, my colleague Mike Weir, MP for Angus, and uh, 
tried to get cross-party support to bring forward the winter fuel payment. He actually had cross-party support for that, so that people off the grid could get paid earlier to try and help pay for their fuel. It was talked out in the Parliament. And now, thankfully, winter fuel payments are going to be uh, come a part of the Scottish Parliament's future power. So the Rural Fuel Poverty Task Force, which meets next month, is going to be looking at welfare reform resources, including winter fuel payments. So during this year, it may be possible for this government to actually bring forward winter fuel payments to the areas where the climate is uh, uh, wettest and where we uh, don't have enough time, I don't think. Thank you very much. I've heard enough of people who use words like you did in the, the, the debate. I am most certainly not, presiding officer, giving you any more space to use evil language. Now, the situation with this uh, debate is that, as far as I'm concerned, things that are practical to do, we will try to do. And when I see some of the measures of improvement that have taken place since 2009, I really think that it's uh, necessary to recognise that that improvement has taken place. But in the conditions where the overall budgets are cut, that is not taken into account by this Liberal Democrat motion. Sanctimonious it is as usual and absolutely cut away from the reality. We have excellent examples in our constituency of district heating systems. How many other constituencies have been setting these up? The one in Wick related to the distillery there is excellent. We've got a situation where uh, we have uh, reliance in Thurso and Wick and various other places of gas that comes from it must be uh, closing soon, by please, road, Mr. Gibson. And the these are under threat. They are going to come not from Liverpool, but from Canvey Island, I believe. And those are things that affect the cost of fuel in my area. You so none close, of these please. details have come out of any of the speeches from the unionist politicians so far, and therefore that makes this debate a farce. Yeah. Many thanks. I call on Claudia Beamish to be followed by Dave Thompson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I certainly think that this debate is far from a farce, and if the Scottish Government addressed the issues and the levers that were in their control, we wouldn't be uh, quite so seriously in fuel poverty and missing our targets this year as we are. This is indeed an important debate, and, uh, having been brought by the Lib Liberal Democrats, and fuel poverty statistics are indeed a scandal, with 34.9% of households affected in 2014. And these are often, as we've heard from many speakers, low-income families with small children, older people, those with disabilities or health problems. As Ken McIntosh highlighted, it is appalling to learn that in 2015 to 16, there were 4,060 excess winter deaths. Comparing this to the lower figures of significantly colder countries like Germany and Sweden, it is undeniable that more must be done. As we have already heard, I don't have time for interventions, no, I'm sorry. As we have already heard, the Scottish Government will not meet its 2016 target. And I would be very interested to hear from the Minister in her closing speech what we are going to be doing, what the Scottish Government is going to be doing for this infrastructure project about which we hear so much. So I, I look forward to that from the Minister. As our motion points out, and Jim Hume stressed, rural fuel poverty is even more grave, and Rob Gibson's highlighted this as well. The UK Fuel Poverty Monitor showed rural households are more than twice as likely to be in extreme <laughs> fuel poverty as urban households, and the fuel poverty decline is less, pronounced than in uh, is less pronounced in rural areas. Where remote communities are off grid, more expensive fuels the only option, older dwellings are hard to heat and insulate and there are higher fuel costs, as we all know, and higher refurbishment costs, as well as higher living costs and often lower incomes, such as in the borders in my region. This can be a slippery slope into fuel poverty and fuel poverty and the ruthless choices that many families have to make. District heating is indeed, as Rob Gibson says, good for a distillery and for, for WIC, uh, for, for the community. But there isn't the option at the moment for low-income families to have a biomass boiler or ground and air source heat pumps, and this is something that could be addressed by the Scottish Government very quickly. I've also had concerns 
with energy efficiency in private rented sector. And this problem is widespread, particularly in historic tenement buildings in large cities, and has a significant effect on the risk of fuel poverty. There is currently a huge gap between the private rented sector and the private sector, and this is due to the lack of standards in place. In 2014, I lodged an amendment to the Housing Bill to take on this issue head-on, requiring landlords to ensure their properties adhere to a minimum energy efficiency standard with penalties for failure to meet these standards. The amendment was labelled, I quote, unnecessary by the Minister, and instead would be considered by the regulation of energy efficiency in private sector homes working group. The postponement of the REAPS consultation is deeply disappointing. Can the Minister explain the reasoning for this delay? To change all this, we need to fill the funding gap, and we have heard from other, other members today about what that gap is. And that is again in the power of the Scottish Must Government. It is them that is in government please. and they need to prioritise energy efficiency and renewable energy issues and support low-income families if this is to be addressed. To change all this, Scottish the Scottish Labour will bring in a warm homes bill with 80% of our houses still here in 2050. This will, amongst other initiatives, develop a retrofitting programme addressing fuel poverty while bringing jobs to local communities and tackling climate change. And thank you very much. I, I now call on Dave Thompson to be followed by Stuart McMillan. Up to four minutes, please. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. As a member for Skylock Harbour and Badenoch, I know only too well the effects of fuel poverty. The rural nature and remote nature of the highlands and islands mean we are uh, at the highest risk of fuel poverty in the country, and we have been suffering from this for some considerable time, although the SNP Government has made in inroads into this. The Scottish Government has spent, as has been said already, a quarter of a billion pounds since 2013 dealing with fuel poverty, and it intends to allocate £103 million for fuel poverty programmes for 2016 and 17. And it does remain firmly committed to the eradication of fuel poverty. Now, this is a very local issue for me. Fuel poverty affects twice as many Sky residents and West Highlanders in my constituency than anyone else in Scotland. To eat or heat is a phrase which has been used many times in this debate over the years, but it is the harsh truth for many. So, to me, it is clear. The North West Highlands needs to be treated as a priority. We are in a restricted financial state at the moment, caused by austerity driven by the Westminster Government. And the Tories and the Liberals and Labour need to recognise that fact. Yeah. Wouldn't it be nice just once for them to accept that the cuts are driven by the Tories in London and that has a knock-on effect on our budgets in Scotland. Yeah, yeah. But within Scotland, I am arguing for a priority for the North and the West. The new regional approach under warmer homes Scotland is welcome, but more needs to be done for off-gas grid areas, certainly. Just, just a knock-on effect, then. Does the member accept the percentage cut to the fuel poverty budget is greater than the change to the overall Scottish budget next year? Mr Thompson? Well, the member is incorrect because, as was explained by the minister earlier on, the budget went down by 15 million from 119 spent in the current year to 103. It's a 16 million reduction. That was because of the cut to heaps. That was a Tory decision in London. Do you accept that, Mr. Brown? No answer. Okay. He doesn't accept it. They don't accept any responsibility whatsoever. Ever. Mr. Brown. Mr. Brown, my, my point was this. In percentage terms, the fuel poverty budget gets a far greater cut than the change to the Scottish Government. Does he accept that that is the case? I don't accept that that is the case. And you didn't answer the question. You didn't accept that the cuts that are being driven by the austerity agenda of your party in London, ably supported One minute, by Le Thompson. Labour and the Lib Dems in Scotland, who never ever criticise the Tories, which doesn't surprise me in the least. Anyway, to get back to, get back to the main point, 
Minister. Energy Action Scotland advises that remote rural and off-gas grid areas need to be better served by the main programmes, in particular with supported measures for hard-to-heat homes and houses using LPG and oil, and I would support that. Next year's energy efficiency budget does need to take into account uh, the, the, the problems in the north and the west. Just These areas need to please. be targeted. The rural areas uh, per specifically, particularly those not on the gas grid, because people on the gas grid have a huge advantage of those who are not on the gas grid. Many thanks. Now Colin Stewart Macmillan, after which we move the closing speech from... Thank you very much, uh, Presiding Officer. Uh, Presiding Officer, the fuel poverty certainly is a complex issue and it's, uh, it actually is full of misconceptions. Fuel poverty doesn't just affect <laughs> pensioners or individuals who rely upon benefits. A fuel poor home is the result of a combination of the household income being below the poverty line and a property having higher than typical energy costs. And uh, certainly in one of the briefings that, uh, that we received uh, for this debate, uh, the briefing that came in from Scottish Gas, uh, it highlights, uh, and this is from their document, that we recognise that affordability is a significant concern for customers and understand that energy costs can be a major component of a business's expenditure. Now, certainly energy costs, not just about business, but certainly energy costs are a huge concern for domestic customers as well. And that's a point that certainly has been brought up in this debate. But unfortunately, uh, Gavin Brown, in his comments earlier on, uh, refused to accept that and just tried to put all the blame upon the Scottish Government, when clearly where the Scottish Government don't have that responsibility, don't have the power uh, over energy costs. And it's something I only have four minutes, Mr Hume, so I can't take intervention today. I'm sorry. Uh, but certainly, come back to the point, uh, the Scottish Government don't have that power. And uh, the above inflation energy increases is something that uh, clearly Scottish Gas recognises as an issue, but unfortunately Gavin Brown and the Conservatives don't. Fuel poverty is often more acute in off-gas uh, grid rural areas, uh, and certainly my colleagues uh, Rob Gibson and uh, Dave Thompson just highlighted that, and where the highlight was that household energy bills are on average 27 per cent higher again. Uh, energy efficient uh, homes play a big role in that. Important drivers uh, of fuel poverty are out with the control of the Scottish Government, uh, but the Scottish Government are determined to do all that they can uh, to tackle it. Uh, in a constrained financial climate, i.e. it cuts from Westminster, uh, the Scottish Government has preserved the resources that are available for energy efficiency. The draft budget, now I know uh, Ken McIntosh highlighted this earlier on, but the draft budget figures published in December show an increase of £40 million in the fuel poverty budget compared to the draft budget for last year. Now that is an increase from £89 million to, the 100, to, to £103 million to tackle fuel poverty and climate change and help improve the condition of Scotland's homes. Now, the Scottish Government, I only have four minutes, Mr McIntosh, I'm sorry, usually I do take an intervention, but I don't, not today. The, the, the Scottish Government has allocated over half a billion pounds since 2009 on a raft of fuel poverty and energy efficiency programmes to help the most vulnerable people in our society uh, heat their homes affordably. And I think it's, it's, I think it's a point that, uh, that seems to have been missed by many in the opposition benches today, that over 900,000 energy efficiency measures have taken place since 2008. That's over 900,000 in Scotland. Now, there are still, I mean, clearly, there is still more work to be done. But I think the opposition parties have to recognise that the work actually, that actually has been undertaken. This Scottish Government uh, certainly has spent, uh, the Scottish Government has spent over £500 million so far. Members and the Scottish Government minute. spending on domestic energy efficiency has already made hundreds of thousands of homes warmer and cheaper to heat and has helped to mitigate the rise in fuel poverty. I'm just about to conclude, presenting officer. In September, the Scottish Government launched a new fuel poverty scheme, which aims to help up to 28,000 more households stay warm over the next seven years. And there is so much more that I could actually talk about, but obviously time uh, is curtailed, so I will leave it at that, presenting officer. Many thanks. I now call on Cameron Buchanan. Up to four minutes, please, Mr Buchanan. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I welcome this opportunity to discuss fuel poverty because it's so important that everyone has affordable access to the energy we all need, especially in the depths of winter. Fuel poverty particularly affects older people, those with disabilities that keep them at home, and families on low incomes. Although the exact situations may differ, I think it is right to say that the three main factors in fuel poverty are relative, relatively low disposable incomes, high prices for energy, and poor levels of energy efficiency in homes. Colleagues across the Chamber have made many points on addressing the issues. 
and there are several options worth considering in detail. However, I think I'll take a slightly different tack here in order to broaden the debate a bit further. When it comes to addressing the problems caused by low disposable incomes, the solution obviously lies in measures that lead to increased levels of income and more of it being disposable. We must therefore direct help accurately to those who need it most at the same time as creating the conditions for economic growth that will sustainably increase employment opportunities and raise incomes in the long term. As for the disposable element, it is clear that we should help people keep more of the money they earn by increasing personal allowance and keeping taxes low where possible. As for the problems associated with high prices for energy, there is certainly work to be done, but we have to ensure that it involves more than just demands to, that prices must be lower and government task forces set up. As we all know, the market, energy market is complex and there can be reluctance to switch providers due to a lot of confusion among the relationships between costs, tariff, customers and end prices. For very, many vulnerable consumers who end up in fuel poverty, it can be the case that they are stuck overpaying for their energy when a better deal could be had if only it was easy to find and secure. For example, customers may be overpaying the odds when they're stuck on a prepayment meters with higher tariffs than direct debit customers. The point I'm getting at is that we need to explore ways to open up and harness consumer power by making switching providers much easier. Such pressure on energy providers can... Thank you very much. I think we've had enough of your interventions. Such pressure on energy providers can play a very important part, role in reducing prices across the board so that the demand on people's incomes can be reduced. Many of my fellow MSPs have rightly pointed out that the energy efficiency of homes is a crucial factor in fuel poverty and an important target if we're to tackle the issue. There are a few worthwhile programmes, but again, I think it's worth broadening the debate with a wider view of the problems. It is right that newly built homes should be as well insulated as they can be, so that their occupants do not waste expensive fuel bills, bills on heating that is simply lost. For this to have a meaningful impact, though, new homes need to be built in the first place. As I mentioned before, we need actively to encourage more house building. At the moment, the system is simply too cumbersome to deliver the level of house, house building we need and slow progress on energy efficiency, and therefore fuel poverty is one of the outcomes. According to the presiding officer, I would like to underline the, my agreement that we need a comprehensive plan for tackling fuel poverty, and I therefore support the amendment in Gavin Brown's name. Preventing fuel poverty is an ambition we must all set our minds to so that the best solutions can be found. However, we must be clear that this should involve more than just setting targets. To make lasting progress, we must create the conditions that allow these primary issues around disposable income, fuel prices and energy efficiency to be tackled for the long term. To do this, we must focus on the causes as well as the symptoms. Thank you. Thank you. And I now call on Michael McMahon. Up to four minutes, Mr McMahon. Thank you, Deputy President. Officer, over the past few months, I've taken part in a few debates on housing where it's been exasperating, to say the least, to hear the Minister and her backbenchers go through such ling linguistic contortions in order to defend the record. Time after time, I've listened to them either simply deny the crisis or try semantic gymnastics to pat themselves on the back despite their continued failure to address the crisis that they are presiding over. While well, they have surpassed themselves this afternoon in their verbal dexterity and their attempts to deflect away from their own responsibility over the current fuel poverty uh, situation. Um, despite their best efforts, uh, Stuart McMillan and Dave Thompson um, did uh, you know, do really well in that regard, but the gold medal uh, has to go to, I think, Mike McKenzie, who has uh, excelled himself. Um, as for Rob Gibson, I think we have to put him down as a DNF, did not finish. <laughs> but there is so much to refute in the SNP's amendment this afternoon that I would take the whole debate to debunk it all. And I only have four minutes. So I'll concentrate on asking a very simple question. What purpose did the Scottish Government think it serves by trying to deflect attention for the situation here towards the situation in the south, the south of the border. Does the Scottish Government really think that people freezing in their homes in Scotland will be in any way warmed up by the thought that less money might be being spent in England? I am pretty sure that most people affected by fuel poverty in Scotland will recognise that that section in the Government's amendment is an utter red herring. It may warm the nationalist cockles, but it does nothing to address the reality of fuel poverty here in Scotland. And to hear the minister, I'll, I'll come back to you, make if I get a chance, but to hear the minister's explanation actually beggars belief. To explain that because a consequential didn't emerge that the SNP have, tried to, uh, have done nothing to address that 
but simply passed on that reduction. It quite clearly shows that they are much happier manning, managing austerity than actually trying to tackle it. I'll take the Minister. Margaret Burgess. I'll ask again, and it's a question Mike McKenzie asked. We were criticised uh, for we didn't get the 15 million in the UK cut our budget, cut that 15 million as well. Can Michael McMahon tell us where that 15 million we can find that in our budget? Mr McMahon. Well, given the budget that you have and given the priorities that you set, it is your responsibility to ensure that you meet the targets that you set. We will make the argument that you've decided to cut you have decided to pass on the cut rather than meet your target, and that is your responsibility. The simple fact is that Scotland has the highest rates of fuel poverty in the UK, and you are doing nothing to address that by the budget that you have set this year, and it is your budget and your responsibility to do so. Almost 60 per cent of single pensioner households and over 40 per cent of pensioner couples live in fuel poverty. Fuel poverty amongst older people can be particularly acute in rural areas, with over 70 per cent of households in the Western Isles alone living in fuel poverty. Disabled people are twice as likely to live in poverty as non-disabled people, making them more likely to experience fuel poverty. Living in a cold home has negative impacts on children's health and well-being, and children who live in privately rented accommodation are more commonly affected by fuel poverty than any children living, uh, than children living in other tenures. Close, the private rented sector has a, great, a, a greater proportion of energy efficient homes than any other tenure, but we have heard absolutely nothing from this government this afternoon about what they would do to address that problem. Who cares? We spend more money on the problem than they do in England. What a disgraceful national, na narrow nationalist attitude to a problem that is your responsibility and you have to address. Yeah, yeah. Many thanks. And I now call on Minister Margaret Burgess. Up to six minutes, please, Ms Burgess. OK. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. And this has certainly been an afternoon of SNP bad. All sides of the chamber suggesting that the SNP government has done nothing to tackle fuel poverty. And that is simply not the case. We have done more than any previous government uh, in, this, in this parliament to tackle fuel poverty. We are not complacent about fuel poverty. It is a real issue. It is a real concern for our constituents, for my constituents, as well as many other people's constituents across this chamber. I will take one intervention because I have things Mr. to Mr. say. Will you go to the Deputy First Minister and ask him to find that £15 million from within the budget to do your job? Oh, here, here we go. Um, Gavin Brown suggested something. His partners the in the uh, Labour Party have picked it up, so that's the question of the afternoon. But what I would say to Gavin Brown, we know what the Tories' answer to fuel poverty is. And yes, I will say what they're doing in the UK. The Tories' answer to fuel poverty is to Order, make everyone Mr. McMahon. Pay to make everyone pay, including the fuel poor. And that's their answer to it. So they've got no answer to it either. None of the parties in this chamber have come forward with a budget. But what I can say to them is, because I've worked with low-income groups all my life, they understand what a budget is, and they understand how competing priorities are. And they know when you're... you're competing with high priorities all over how they have to uh, set that budget up. And we have asked, we have asked the opposition, no, I'm taking no more interventions. We have asked the opposition to tell us where, that, where we should adjust our budget. What are we spending too much money on? Is it housing? Is it health? Is it education? What are we spending the money on uh, that you're telling us that we're not spending? So what we are doing, though, as a government, we're listening to stakeholders in the sector and we're investing in fuel poverty measures and we're providing a long-term commitment to tackle fuel poverty. And yes, we'll tackle it head on. We're in investing unprecedented levels of funding. No, I'm taking no more interventions. We're investing unprecedented levels of funding, significantly more than any previous government in Scotland. We've invested over half a billion pounds to 209 on a raft of fuel poverty and energy efficiency programmes. And this year, we made available a record 119 million pounds. And this investment not only supports those in fuel poverty, it supports around 1,300 full-time jobs. And that's what will be supported across the Scottish economy next year. And we know that there are hundreds more people employed in the industry than there were in 2009. And we also know that the industry welcomes the investment made by the Scottish Government and values the role it has in supporting jobs. 
and our efforts are paying off, with nearly one in every three households having received measures to make their home more energy efficient since 2008. And the variety of schemes under the HEAPS banner today gives households a wider range of support than ever before. And I think both Rob Gibson and um, Dave Thompson talked about the, the particular difficulties in rural areas. And we're looking very closely at that. And rural areas do get more per head of population um, than other areas of Scotland. And that's because it recognises those issues. I'll take one intervention. Can I, thank, can I thank the Minister for taking intervention? In, in taking credit uh, for all the achievements over the years, including the credit that Alec Neil tried to claim for the £119 million spent uh, last year, did Mr Neil thank the UK Government for this money, or does he only mention the UK Government when he's blaming them for cuts? I think that's just an absolutely ridiculous question to ask when we are talking something about the seriousness of fuel poverty in rural, area, rural areas and, why, and, how we are trying to, and how we are trying to tackle it. And, and we are trying to tackle it and we know we need to do more. And that's why we're looking and working still with the, the task force. We've got a rural poverty fuel task force. We have the a fuel poverty forum and we're working with all of them to come together to, to produce to develop our national scheme and only last week Alec Neil announced that 14 million pounds funds that will allow councils across Scotland to make homes public buildings and businesses more energy efficient and that's part of Scotland's national energy efficiency program and this funding will pilot new and innovative approaches to energy efficiency with community groups and businesses which will help improve warmth in buildings and homes, drive down energy bills and work towards reaching climate change targets. These initiatives can then be taken forward when SEEP is rolled out fully in 2018. The development of energy efficiency as a national infrastructure priority will create transformational change in improving the energy efficiency and heating of homes, businesses and public buildings in Scotland reducing fuel bills and greenhouse gas emissions. Through SEEP, we'll introduce multi-year funding that will give our delivery partners the certainty they need to deliver ambitious energy efficient projects, energy efficiency projects, and it demonstrates our long-term -term commitment to tackling fuel poverty. And we have had successes today, and they have been hampered by many challenges. Above inflation price rises can explain rises in fuel poverty. She but alongside this, Minister. the UK government's changes to the energy company obligation and the withdrawal of Green, green Deal support caused uncertainty and has impacted on the delivery of many measures. The only funding announced for fuel poverty and energy efficiency in the UK government spending close, review and autumn statement, as I said to, to Gavin Brown, was through energy supplier obligations and a regressive form of taxation. Presiding officer, we've achieved a great deal despite the lack of support from the UK you government close, and despite please. rising fuel prices. This government remains passionately committed to ending fuel poverty in Scotland. We will continue to push the boundaries and encourage innovative solutions to ensure everyone in Scotland lives in a warm home. Thanks can very much. Heat. Now call on Alison McInnes to wind up the debate. Uh, Ms McInnes, you have until 4.59, please. Thank you very much. Fuel poverty is often mentioned in passing in debates on health and housing, for example, but this full parliament hasn't had a dedicated fuel poverty debate outside members' business since April 2014, and that's why we allocated time for this in our business today. And just as the Parliament came together to set a fuel poverty target in 2001, Scottish Liberal Democrats believe that it now needs to come together to have a constructive, honest debate about how we are progressing against this Parliament's laudable and continuing ambition to eradicate fuel poverty. The debate has been largely um, worthwhile, although there have been some interesting contributions, I have to say. Um, I welcome the support of, um, and the commitment of other opposition parties and indeed the, um, the Minister who says that we're all still committed to the eradication of fuel poverty. Um, Ken McIntosh, I think, was right to highlight the excess winter deaths and, and Claudia Beamish right to point out in particular uh, the problems facing rural areas and off-grid customers. Uh, Gavin Brown, I think, was right when he said that this uh, genuinely poor record in terms of tackling um, fuel poverty is the Achilles heel of the Scottish Government. 
Rob Gibson said it was a complex problem, and I agree it is a complex problem, but he then went on to give a very intemperate contribution, which we would be best to uh, gloss over. Dave Thompson seems to think it's all Westminster's fault. I'm happy to acknowledge, as Stuart Macmillan said, that there are three key drivers of fuel poverty. Fuel costs, low income and energy efficiency. But contrary to Dave Thompson's asserting, assertion, actually all of the opposition parties stated that in their contributions this afternoon. But they then went on to focus on what we can affect here in our devolved parliament. And as Michael McMahon said, I didn't hear anything from the SNP about taking responsibility for the levers that they do control. I must take the Minister to task. No one said that the SNP had done nothing for fuel poverty. But I say to Margaret Burgess, have you done enough? And the answer is, no, you haven't. And that's not just my verdict, it's the verdict of Energy Action Scotland, WWF and many other campaigners. There has, of course, been general agreement that fuel poverty is an anathema. I said we needed to have a constructive and honest debate. But, you know, truth be told, it's not been as frank as it could have been. It doesn't surprise me, though it always disappoints me, that the government sticks true to form. The amendment in the Minister's name calls for everyone else to do more, yep. while being overly self-congratulatory of its own achievements. It's a lengthy amendment. <laughs> that plays around with stats, deploys smoke and mirrors over the budget, and of course it resorts to the usual if only moan that we hear and hear every day. Yeah. You know, we were elected by our constituents to apply ourselves assiduously and imaginatively to solving the problems they face within the powers of this parliament. But it seems instead that the SNP prefer applying their imagination to drafting amendments. Yeah. Spending in 2016-17 is set to be lower than it has been in 2015-16. There's just no getting away from that fact. Whether it was budgeted in advance or not, there is projected to be a reduction in funding next year compared to this year. That's a cut. The Minister asked how to fund a reinstatement. Well, there's a simple answer. This would be a, a preventative spend. It costs the health service £80 million a year to deal with the, the impact of cold homes. So to quote Joe Biden, don't tell me what you value, show me your budget and I'll tell you what you value. The Scottish Government has so far refused to acknowledge that it is set to miss its targets to ensure that by November 2016, people are not living in fuel poverty. If we are to end the misery caused by fuel poverty, then we need to start with a frank assessment of progress to date. And the SNP's refusal to admit that they're going to miss the target doesn't help us move forward. And the Minister's claim to be tackling fuel poverty head-on prevents a new course of action being taken now. So I urge the SNP to agree that we can and we must do more here in Scotland using our existing devolved powers to tackle the scourge of fuel poverty. I support the calls from the Director of Energy Action Scotland, Norman Kerr, who has urged Scottish Ministers to acknowledge that the 2016 target will not be met and to start discussions on producing a new fuel poverty strategy for Scotland. We are entirely supportive, of course, of eradicating fuel poverty, but ministers need to face up to the reality of what is happening and reconsider how best to address the problem. Jim Hume, in opening the debate, set out the scale of the problem still facing us here in Scotland. In 2014, the level of fuel poverty was 34.9%. That's 845,000 households, with 9.5% in extreme fuel poverty. This compares to 35.8% in 2013. That's not much progress. That's well over three quarters of a million people struggling each day to heat their homes. Unaffordable fuel bills force households to restrict their heating and live in a miserably cold home, with consequences for physical and mental health and social well-being. High fuel bills force people to sacrifice spending on other essentials, including food, compounding hardship and leading to additional health implications. Scotland has the highest rates of fuel poverty in the UK. The wider social and economic impact of fuel poverty makes this a serious cause for concern. As Age Scotland outlined in a briefing, while fuel poverty affects us all, it has a disproportionate impact on older people. Over half of single pensioner households 
58%, and nearly half, 44%, of pensioner couples live in full poverty. And the World Health Organization attributes 30% of preventable deaths to cold and poorly insulated housing. As Ken McIntosh said last winter, Scotland saw excess mortality rates reach a record high of 22,000 deaths. Ill health caused by cold housing costs the NHS in Scotland up to £80 million a year. That's where the money should come from, Minister. We support Labour's amendment as a warm homes bill could provide the necessary impetus. But we don't need to wait for a bill in the next session. The Government has designated energy efficiency as a national infrastructure priority. But beyond that grand sounding name, there is no detail of what it means in reality. It has no overall objective. The existing Homes Alliance points out that improving the energy performance of Scotland's poor quality housing stock is a fundamental solution to tackling fuel poverty and is the cause of fuel poverty over which the Scottish Government has the most powers. So that surely should be the objective of the national infrastructure priority. But there are other things that can be helped too. Um, I'm looking at the time, President Officer, and I shall move to closing. There is no doubt that health, economic, social and environmental impacts of fuel poverty are significant. Presiding officer, there have been plenty of warm words today, but we need concerted action and a renewed sense of urgency to ensure everyone in Scotland lives in a warm home. Thank you, Ms McInnes. That concludes the debate on fuel poverty. The next item of business is consideration of business motion number 15437 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau setting out a business programme. Any member wish to speak against the motion should press the request speak button now and I call on Joe Fitzpatrick to move motion number 15437. Moved. No member has asked to speak against the motion, therefore I now put the question to the Chamber. The question is that motion number 15437, in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick, be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The motion is therefore agreed to. The next item of business is consideration of business motion number 15436, in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick, on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau, setting out a stage two timetable for the Higher Education Government Scotland Bill. Any member who wishes to speak against the motion should press the request to speak button now. I call on Joe Fitzpatrick to move motion number 15436. Moved. No member is asked to speak against the motion. Therefore, I now put the question to the Chamber. The question is that motion number 15436, in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick, be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The motion is therefore agreed to. The next item of business is consideration of two parliamentary bureau motions. I would ask Joe Fitzpatrick to move motion number 15438 on approval of an SSI and motion number 15439 on substitution on committees. Moved. The questions on these motions will be put at decision time. The next item of business should have been consideration of motion number 1541. Sorry. Sorry. Uh, the next item of business is consideration of motion number 15415 in the name of Fergus Ewing on the Bankrupts of Scotland Bill. I call on Fergus Ewing to move the motion. Question on this motion. We put a decision time to which we now come. There are 11 questions to be put as a result of today's business. Can I remind members in relation to today's debate on education? If the amendment in the name of Angela Constance is agreed, the amendments in the name of Ian Gray and Liz Smith fall. The first question is amendment number 15430.3 in the name of Angela Constance, which seeks to amend motion number 15430 in the name of Liam MacArthur on education be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The Parliament's not agreed. We move to vote. Members should cast their votes now.
the result of the vote on amendment number 15430.3 in the name of Angela Constance is as follows. Yes, 60. No, 39. There were 14 abstentions. The amendment is therefore agreed to and the amendments in the name of Ian Gray and Liz Smith fall. The next question then is at motion number 15430. In the name of Liam MacArthur, as amended on education, be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Parliament's not agreed. We move to vote. Members should cast their votes now. The result of the vote on motion number 15430 in the name of Liam MacArthur as amended is as follows. Yes, 60. No, 39. There were 14 abstentions. The motion as amended is therefore agreed to. Can I remind members that in relation to the debate on fuel poverty, if the amendment in the name of Margaret Burgess is agreed, the amendment in the name of Gavin Brown falls. The question then is that amendment number 15432.3 in the name of Margaret Burgess, which seeks to amend motion number 15432 in the name of Jim Hume on fuel poverty be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Parliament's not agreed. We move to a vote. Members should cast it what votes now. The result of the vote on amendment number 15432.3 in the name of Margaret Burgess is as follows. Yes, 60. No, 53. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore agreed to and the amendment in the name of Gavin Brown falls. The next question is amendment number 15432.2 in the name of Ken McIntosh which seeks to amend motion number 15432 in the name of Jim Hume as amended by Margaret Burgess on fuel poverty be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Oh. The Parliament's not agreed. We move to a vote. Members should cast their votes now. The result of the vote on amendment number 15432.2 in the name of Ken McIntosh is as follows. Yes, 40. No, 73. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed to. And the amendment in the name of Gavin Brown has already fallen. The next question is uh, motion number 15432 in the name of Jim Hume as amended on fuel poverty be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The Parliament's not agreed. We move to a vote. Members should cast their votes now. Thank you. 
The result of the vote on motion number 15432 in the name of Jim Hume as amended is as follows. Yes, 60. No, 53. There were no abstentions. The motion as amended is therefore agreed to. The next question is that motion number 15415 in the name of Fergus Shewing on the Bankrupts of Scotland Bill be agreed to. Are we all agreed? The motion is therefore agreed to. The next question is that motion number 15438 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick on approval of an SSI be agreed to. Are we all agreed? The motion is therefore agreed to. The next question is that motion number 15439 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick on substitution on committees be agreed to. Are we all agreed? The motion is therefore agreed to. That concludes decision time. We now move to members' business. Members leaving the chamber should do so quickly and quietly.